Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. Most people think hackers have extraordinary skill and knowledge that allow them to hack into computer systems and find valuable information. The term hacker conjures up images of a young computer who, is, who types a few commands at a computer screen and proof the computer spits out passwords, account numbers or other confidential data. In reality, a good hacker or security professional acting as an ethical hacker just has to understand how a computer system works and know what tools to employ in order to find a security weakness. This lecture will teach you the same techniques and software tools that many hackers use to gather valuable data and attack computer systems. The realm of hackers and how they operate is unknown to most computer and security professionals. Hackers use specialized computer software tools to gain access to information. By learning the same skill and employing the software tools used by hackers, you will be able to defend your computer networks and system against malicious attacks. The goal of this first lecture is to introduce you to the world of the hacker and to define the terminology used in discussing computer security. To be able to defend against malicious hacker, security professionals must first understand how to employ ethical hacking techniques. This lecture will detail the tools and techniques used by hackers so that you can use those tools to identify potential risk in your computer system. This lecture will guide you through the hacking process as a good guy. Most ethical hackers are in the business of hacking for profit an activity known as penetration testing or pin testing for short. Pin testing is usually conducted by a security professional to identify security risk and vulnerabilities in systems and networks. The purpose of identifying risks and vulnerabilities is so that a countermeasure can be put in place and the risk mitigated to some degree ethical hackers are in the business of hacking and as such need to conduct themselves in a professional manner additionally state country or international laws must be understood and carefully considered prior to using hacking software and techniques staying within the law is a must for the ethical hacker an ethical hacker is acting as a security professional when performing pin tests and must always act in a professional manner Defining Ethical Hacking The next section will explain the purpose of ethical hacking and exactly what ethical hackers do. As mentioned earlier, ethical hackers must allow act in a professional manner to differentiate themselves from malicious hackers, gaining the trust of the client and taking all precautions to do no harm to their systems during a pin test are critical to bring a professional another key component of ethical hacking is to always gain permission from the data owner prior to accessing the computer system this is one of the ways ethical hackers can overcome the stereotype of hackers and gain the trust of clients the goal ethical hackers are trying to achieve in their hacking attempts will be explained later Understanding the purpose of ethical hacking. When I tell people that I am an ethical hacker, I usually hear sneakers and comments like that's an oxymoron. Many people ask, can hacking be ethical? Yes, that best describes what I do as a security professional. I use the same software tools and techniques as malicious hackers to find the security weakness in computer network and systems. Then I apply the necessary fix or patch to prevent the malicious hacker from gaining access to the data. This is a never-ending cycle as new weaknesses are constantly being discovered in computer systems and patches are created by the software vendors to mitigate the risk of attacks. Ethical hackers are usually security professional or network penetration testers who use their hacking skills and tool sets for defensive and protective purposes. Ethical hackers who are security professionals test their network and system security for vulnerabilities using the same tools that a hacker might use to compromise the network. Any computer professional can learn the skill of ethical hacking.
the term cracker describes a hacker who uses their hacking skills and tool set for destructive or offensive purposes such as disseminating viruses or performing denial of services attacks to compromise or bring down systems and network no longer just looking for fun these hackers are sometimes paid to damage corporate reputations or steal or reveal credit card information while slowing business processes and compromising the integrity of the organization white hats white hats are the good guys the ethical hackers who use their hacking skills for defensive purposes white hat hackers are usually security professional with knowledge of hacking and the hacker tool set and who use this knowledge to locate weakness and implement countermeasures white hat hackers are prime candidates for the exam white hats are those who hack with permission from the data owner it is critical to get permission prior to the beginning any hacking activity this is what makes a security professional a white hat versus a malicious hacker who cannot be trusted black hats black hats are the bad guys the malicious hackers or crackers who use their skills for illegal or malicious purposes they break into or otherwise violate the system integrity of remote systems with malicious intent having gained unauthorized access black hat hackers destroy vital data deny legitimate user service and just cause problems for their targets black hat hackers and crackers can easily be differentiated from white hat hackers because their actions are malicious this is the traditional definition of a hacker and what most people consider a hacker to be gray hats gray hats are hackers who may work offensive or defensively depending on the situation this is the dividing line between hacker and cracker gray hat hackers may just be interested in hacking tools and technologies and are not malicious black hats gray hats are self proclaimed ethical hackers who are interested in hacker tools mostly from a curiosity standpoint they may want to highlight security problems in a system or educate victims so they secure their systems properly these hackers are doing their victims a favor for instance if a weak weakness is discovered in a service offered by an investment bank the hacker is doing the bank a favor by giving the bank a chance to rectify the vulnerability from a more controversial point of view some people consider the act of hacking itself to be unethical like breaking and entering but the belief that ethical hacking excludes destruction at least moderates the behavior of people who see themselves as benign hackers according to this view it may be one of the highest forms of hackerly courtesy to break into a system and then explain to the system operator exactly how it was done and how the hole can be plugged the hacker is uh, acting as an unpaid and unsolicited tiger team this approach has gotten many ethical hackers in legal trouble make sure you know the law and your legal liabilities when engaging in ethical hacking activity the difference between white hats and gray hats is that permission word although gray hats might have good intention without the correct permission they can no longer be considered ethical hello everyone welcome to my lecture scanning is the first phase of active hacking and is used to locate target system or networks for the later attack enumeration is the follow on step once scanning is complete and is used to identify computer names usernames and shares scanning and enumeration are discussed together in this lecture because many hacking tools perform both steps simultaneously scanning after the reconnaissance and information gathering stages have been completed scanning is performed it is important that the information gathering stage be as complete as possible to identify the best location and targets to scan 
during scanning the hacker continues to gather information regarding the network and its individual host systems information such as ip addresses operating system services and install application can help the hacker determine which type of exploit to use in hacking a system scanning is the process of locating system that are alive and responding on the network ethical hackers use scanning to identify target system ip addresses scanning is also used to determine whether a system is on the network and available scanning tools are used to gather information about a system such as ip addresses the operating system and services running on the target computer port scanning port scanning is the process of identifying open and available tcp slash ip ports on a system port scanning tools enable a hacker to learn about the services available on a given system each service or application on a machine is associated with a well-known port number port number are divided into three range well-known port 01023 registered ports 1024491591 dynamic ports 491526535 common port number on windows systems well known port numbers are located in the c drive services is a hidden file to view it show hidden files in windows explorer and double click the file name to open it with notepad the CEH exam expects you to know the well-known port number for common application. Network scanning. Network scanning is a procedure for identifying active hosts on a network, either to attack them or as a network security assessment. Hosts are identified by their individual IP addresses. Network scanning tools attempt to identify all the live or responding hosts on the network and their corresponding IP addresses. Vulnerability scanning. Vulnerability scanning is the process of proactively identifying the vulnerabilities of computer systems on a network. Generally, a vulnerability scanning first identifies the operating system and version number including service packs and may be installed then the scanner identifies weaknesses or vulnerabilities in the operating system during the later attack phase a hacker can exploit those weaknesses in order to gain access to the system all the scanning can quickly identify which hosts are listening and active on a network it is also a quick way to be identify by an intrusion detection system scanning tools probe tcp slash ip ports looking for open ports and ip addresses and these probes can be recognized by most security intrusion detection tools network and vulnerability scanning can usually be detected as well because the scanner must interact with the target system over the network Depending on the type of scanning application and the speed of the scan and IDS will detect the scanning and flag it as an IDS event. Some of the tools for scanning have different modes to attempt to defeat an IDS and are more likely to be able to scan undetected. As a CEH, it is your job to gather as much information as possible and try and remember undetected the ceh scanning methodology as a ceh you are expected to be familiar with the scanning methodology presented uh, below this methodology is the process by which a hacker scans the network it ensures that no system or vulnerability is overlooked and that the hacker gathers all necessary information to perform an attack we will look at the various stages of this scanning methodology throughout this lecture, starting with the first three steps, checking for systems that are live and for open ports and services identification. Ping sweep techniques. The CEH scanning methodology starts with checking for systems that are live on the network. 
meaning that they respond to proofs or connection requests the simplest although not necessarily the most accurate way to determine whether systems are live is to perform a ping sweep of the IP address range all system that respond with a ping reply are considered live on the network a ping sweep is also known as internet control message protocol scanning as ICMP is the protocol used by the ping command ICMP scanning or a ping sweep is the process of sending an ICMP request or ping to all hosts on the network to determine which ones are up and responding to pings ICMP begin as a protocol used to send test and error messages between host on the internet it has evolved as a protocol utilized by every operating system router switch or internet protocol based device the ability to use ICMP echo request and echo reply as a connectivity test between host is built into every IP enabled device via the ping command it is a quick and dirty test to see if two hosts have connectivity and is used extensively for troubleshooting. A benefit of ICMP scanning is that it can be run in parallel, meaning all systems are scanned at the same time. Thus, it can run quickly on an entire network. Most hacking tools include a ping sweep option which essentially means performing an ICMP request to every host on the network. Systems that respond with a ping response are alive and listening on the network. Once considerable problems with this method is that personal firewall software and network-based firewalls can block a system for, from responding to ping sweeps. More and more systems are configured with firewall software and will block the ping attempt and notify the user that a scanning program is running on the network another problem is that the computer must be on mm, to be scanned detecting ping sweeps almost any ids or intuition prevention system will detect and alert the security administrator to a ping sweep occurring on the network most firewall and proxy servers block ping responses so a hacker can't accurately determine whether systems are available using a ping sweep alone. More intense port scanning must be used if systems don't respond to a ping sweep. Just because a ping sweep doesn't return any active hosts on the network doesn't mean they aren't available. You need to do try an alternative method of identification. Remember, hacking ta takes time, patience, and persistence. Scanning ports and identifying services. Checking port open ports is the second step in the CEH scanning methodology. Port scanning is the method used to check for open ports. The process of port scanning involves probing each port on a host to determine which ports are open. Port scanning generally yields more uh, valuable information than a ping sweep about the host and vulnerabilities on the system. Service identification is the third step in the CEH scanning methodology. It's usually performed using the same tools as port scanning. By identifying open ports, a hacker can usually also identify the service associated with the port number. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. Passive online attacks. A passive online attack is also known as a sniffing the password on a wired or wireless network. A passive attack is not detectable to the end user. The password is captured during the authentication process and can then be compared against a dictionary file or word list. User account passwords are commonly hashed or encrypted when sent on the network to prevent unauthorized access and use. If the password is protected by encryption or hashing, special tools is the hacker's toolkit can be used to break the algorithm. Another passive online attack is known as main in the middle. In a MITM attack, the hacker intercepts the authentication request and forwards it to the server by inserting a snippers between the client and the server the hacker is able to snip both connections and capture password in the process 
uh, replay attack is also a passive online attack. It occurs when the hacker intercepts the password and wrote to the authentication server and then captures and resends the authentication packets for later authentication. In this manner, the hacker doesn't have to break the password or learn the password through MITM but rather captures the password and reissues the password authentication packets later to authenticate as the client. Active online attacks The easiest way to gain administrator level access to a system is to guess a simple password assuming the administrator used a simple password. Password guessing is an active online attack. It relies on the human factor involved in password creation and only work on weak passwords. When we discuss the enormous phase of system hacking, you learn the vulnerability of NetBIOS, enumeration and null sessions. Assuming that the NetBIOS TCP139 port is open, the most effective method of breaking into a Windows NT or Windows 2000 system is password guessing. This is done by attempting to connect to an enumerated share and trying a username and password combination. The most commonly used administrator account and password combinations are words like admin, administrator, sysadmin, or a password or a null password. A hacker may first try to con connect to a default admin. To connect to the hidden C drive share automated programs can quickly generate dictionary files, word lists or every possible combination of letters, numbers and special characters and then attempt to log on using those credentials. Most systems prevent this type of attack by setting a maximum number of logging in attempts on a system before the account is locked. In the following section, we will discuss how hackers can perform authentic automated password guessing more closely as well as countermeasures to such attacks. Performing automated password guessing To speed up the guessing of a password, hackers use automated tools. An easy process for automating password guessing is to use the Windows shell commands based on the standard net use syntax to create a simple automated password guessing script perform the following steps number one create a simple username and password file using windows notepad automated tools such as the dictionary generated are available to create this word list save the file on the c drives credentials.txt pipe this file using the for command c4 slash f token type Number 3. Type net use to use the credential.txt file to attempt to log on to the target system hidden share. Defending against password guessing. Two options exist to defend against password guessing and password attacks. Both smart cards and biometric add a layer of security to the insecurity that's inherent when user create their own passwords. A user can also be authenticated and validated using biometrics. Biometrics use physical characteristics such as fingerprints, hand geometry scans, and retinal scans as credentials to validate users. Both smart cards and biometrics use two-factor authentication, which requires two forms of identification. Uh, when validating a user by requiring something the user physically has and the something the user knows security is increased and the authentication process isn't susceptible, susceptible to password attack. Offline attacks. Offline attacks are performed from a location other than the actual computer where the password are reside or where used. Offline attacks usually require physical access to the computer and copying the password file from the system onto removal media. The hacker then takes the file to another computer to perform the cracking. Several types of offline password attacks exist. Non-electronic attacks. 
non electronic or non technical attacks are attacks that do not employ any technical knowledge this kind of attack can include social engineering shoot surfing keyboard sniffing and dumpster diving social engineering is the art of interacting with people either face to face or over the telephone and getting them to give out valuable information such as passwords social engineering relies on people's good nature and desire to help others many times a help desk is the target of a social engineering attack because their job is to help people and recovering or resetting passwords is a common function of the help desk the best defense against social engineering attacks is security awareness training for all employees and security procedures for resetting passwords dumpster diving hackers look through the thas for information such as password which may be written down on a piece of paper again security awareness training on shredding important documents can prevent a hacker from gathering password by dumpster diving cracking a password manual password cracking involves attempting to log on with the different passwords the hacker follows the systems one find a valid user account such as administrator or guest to create a list of possible password three rank the password from high to low probability four key in each password five try again until a successful password is found a hacker can also create a script file that tries each password in a list this is still considered manual cracking but it's time consuming and not usually effective a more efficient way of cracking a password is to gain access to the password file on a system most system has a password for storage on a system during the logon process the password entered by the user is hashed using the same algorithm and then compared to the hashed password stored in the file a hacker can attempt to gain access to the hashing algorithm stored on the server instead of trying to guess or otherwise identify the password if the hacker is successful they can dis- decrypt the password stored on the server remember passwords are stored in the security accounts manager file on a windows system and in a password shadow file on a linux system hello everyone welcome to my lecture during a denial of service dos attack a hacker renders a system unusable or significantly slows the system by overload dead in resources are preventing legitimate users from accessing the system these attacks can be perpetrated against an individual system or an entire network and are usually successful in their attempts the hacking attack is one of the availability meaning legitimate users no longer have access to the network session hijacking is a hacking method that creates a temporary dos for an end user when an attacker takes over the session session hijacking is used by hackers to take over a current session after the user has established an authenticated session session hijacking can also be used to perpetrate a man in the middle attack when the hacker steps between the server and legitimate client and intercepts all traffic this lecture explains dos attacks it is attributed denial of service attacks and the elements of session hijacking such as spoofing methods the tcp three way handshake sequence number prediction and how hackers use tools for session hijacking in addition the countermeasures for dos and session hijacking are discussed discussed denial of service a dos attack is an attempt by a hacker to flood a user or an organization system as a ceh you need to be familiar with the types of dos attacks and should understand how dos and ddos attack works you should also be familiar with robots and robot networks as well as smurf attacks and scene flooding 
finally as a ceh you need to be familiar with various dos and ddos countermeasures there are two main categories of dos attacks one attack sent by a single system to a single target two attack sent by many system to a single target the goal of DOS isn't to gain unauthorized access to machines or data, but to prevent legitimate users of a service from using it. A DOS attack may do the following. 1. Flood a network with traffic, thereby preventing legitimate network traffic. 2. Disrupt connections between two machines, thereby preventing access to a service. 3. Prevent a particular individual from accessing a service. 4. Disrupt service to a specific system or option. Different tools use different types of traffic to flood a victim, but the result is the same. A service on the system or the entire system is unavailable to a user because it's kept busy trying to respond to an exorbitant number of requests. How DDoS attack work? DDoS is an advanced version of the DDoS attack. Like DDoS, DDoS tries to deny access to service running on a system by sending packets to the destination system in a way that the destination system can handle. The key of a DDoS attack is that it relies attacks from many different hosts. Hacking tools Trino is a tool that sends user datagram protocol traffic to create a DDoS attack. The Trino Master is a system used to launch a DDoS attack against one or more target system. The master instructs agent processes on previously compromised systems to attack one or more IP addresses. This attack occurs for a specified period of time. The Trino agent or daemon is installed on a system that suffers from a buffer overflow vulnerability. When Trino is a Windows versions of Trino and has the same functional as Trino. Sept is a derivative of the Trino tool that uses UDP communication between masters and agents. Sept provides statics on the flood attack that attackers can use to know when the victim system is shut down. Sept provides UDP, ICMP and TCP flooding attack options. Tribal flood network allows an attacker to use both bandwidth depletion and resource depletion attacks. TFN does UDP and ICMP flooding as well as TCP, SYN and SMARF attacks. TFN 2K is based on TFN with features designed specifically to make TFN 2K traffic difficult to recognize and filter. It remotely executes commands, hides the sources of the attack using IP address, spoofing, and uses multiple transport protocols. Stretchel Trat is similar to TFN and includes ICMF flood, UDP flood, and TCP scene attack options. It also provides a secure te telnet connection using symmetric key encryption between the attacker and the agent system. This prevents system administrators from intercepting and identifying this traffic. M-Stream uses smoothed TCP packets with the ACK plug set to attack a target. It consists of a handler and an agent portion, but access to handler is password protected. The services under attack are those of the primary victim. The compromised systems used to launch the attack are secondary victims. These compromised systems which send the DDoS to the primary victim are sometimes called zombies or boats. They are usually compromised through another attack and then used to launch an attack on the primary victim at a certain time or under certain condition. It can be difficult to track the source of the attacks because they are originated from several IP addresses. Master and slabs in a DDoS attack are shown below. How boats slash boatnets work? A boat is short for web robot and is an 
automated software program that behaves intelligently. Spammers often use bots to automate the posting of spam message on news groups or the sending of emails. Bots can also be used as remote attack tools. Most often, bots are web software agents that interface with web pages. For example, web crawlers, spiders are web robots that gather web page information. The most dangerous bots are those that covertly install themselves on user's computer for malicious purposes. Some bots communicate with other users of internet-based services via instant messaging, internet relay chat, or another web interface. These bots allow IRQ users to ask questions in plain English and then formulate a proper response. Such bots can often handle many tasks, including reporting weather, providing zip code information, listing sport scores, converting e units of measures such as currency, and so on. A botnet is a group of bot systems. Botnets serve various purposes, including DDoS attacks, creation or misuse of simple mail transfer protocol mail relays for spam, internet marketing fraud, and the theft of application serial numbers, login IDs, and financial information such as credit card numbers. Generally, a botnet refers to a group of compromised systems running a bot for the purpose of launching a coordinated DDoS attack. An autonomy of a distributed DOS attack are shown below. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture, Daniel of Service Attack. On the evening of May 28, 2008, the company I was working for sa suddenly dropped off the internet. Their web servers were no longer accessible from the internet. Within a minute of the start of the attack, it was clear to the Alpha system engineers that they were experiencing a packet flooding attack of some sort. After looking at the log files of their Cisco router, it showed that both of their 2T1 trunk interfaces to the internet were receiving some sort of traffic at their maximum 1.5 megabyte rate. While their outbound traffic had fallen to nearly zero, they were drowning in a flood of malicious traffic and valid traffic was unable to get out. Alpha system was the victim of a denial of server attack, more commonly referred to as a DOS. The engineers knew they had to do something quickly to stop the attacks and get the web server back up and accessible for their customers, but no one really knew what to do as this had never happened to the system before. Then someone thought of the packet filtering capabilities of the router. Luckily, because this DOT attack was prone to filtering, Alpha system was able to weed out the bad packets and return their service to almost normal operation. In two minutes, Alpha system engineers applied brute force filters to their routers, shutting down all UDP and ICMP traffic, and uh, alphasystem.com instantly popped back onto the network. A DOS attack is usually an attack of last uh, resort. It's considered an unsophisticated attack because it doesn't gain the hacker access to any information but rather annoys the target and interrupts their service. DOS attacks can be destructive and have a substantial impact when sent from multiple systems at the same time. Remember, because DOS attacks are so powerful and can cripple a production system or network, this lecture does not include any DOS tool ex exercises. If you want to test the tools listed here, ensure that you are not using them on a production network or systems. The DOS tools could render the target systems unusable. DDoS attacks can be uh, perpetrated by bots and botnets, which are compromised systems that an attacker uses to launch the attack against the end victim. 
the system or network that has been compromised is a secondary victim, whereas the DOS and DDoS attacks flood the primary victim or target. How DDoS attacks work? DDoS is an advanced version of the DOS attack. Like DOS, DDoS tries to deny access to service running on a system by sending packets to the destination system in a way that the destination system can handle. The key of a DDoS attack is that re it relies attacks from many different hosts which must first be compromised rather than from a single host like DOS. DDoS is a large scale coordinator attack on a victim system. The services under attack are those of the primary victim. The compromised system used to launch the attack are secondary victims. These compromised systems which send the DDoS to the primary victim are sometimes called zombies or bots. They are usually compromised through another attack and then used to launch an attack on the primary victim at a certain time or under certain conditions. It can be difficult to track the source of the attacks because they originated from several IP addresses. Normally DDoS consists of three parts master slash handler, slave slash secondary victim slash zombie slash agent slash bot slash botnet, victim slash primary victim. The master is the attack launcher. A slave is a host that is compromised by, uh, by and controlled by the master. The victim is the target system. The master directs the slave to the launch the attack on the victim systems. DDoS is done in two phases. In the intuition phase, the hacker compromises weak systems in different networks around the world and installs DDoS tools on those compromised slave systems. In the DDoS attack phase, the slave systems are triggered to cause them to attack the primary victim. How boot slash bootnets work? A boot is short for web robot and is an automated software program that behaves intelligently. Spam hours often use boots to automate the posting of spam message on news groups or the sending of emails. The most dangerous boots are those that covertly install themselves on users' computers for malicious purposes. A bootnet is a group of boot systems. Bootnets serve various purposes, including DDoS attacks, creation or misuse of simple mail transfer protocol. Mail relies for spam, internet marketing fraud, and the theft of applications, serial number, login IDs, and financial information such as credit card numbers. Generally, a bootnet refers to a group of compromised systems running a boot for the purpose of launching a coordinated DDoS attack. Anatomy of a distributed DOS attack are shown below. Smurf and Sync Flood Attacks A Smurf attack sends a large amount of ICMP eco traffic to a broadcast IP addresses with the spoofed source addresses of a victim. Each secondary victim's host on that IP network replies to the ICPM eco request with an eco reply, multiplying the traffic by the number of hosts responding. On a multi access broadcast network, hundreds of machines might reply to each packet. This creates a magnified DOS attack of ping replies flooding the primary victim. IRC serves are the primary victim of smurf attacks on the internet. A sync flood attack sends TCP connection requests faster than a machine can process them. The attacker creates a random source addresses for each packet and sets the sync flood to request a new connection to the server from the spoofed IP address. DOS slash DDoS countermeasures Network ingress filtering All network access providers should implement network filtering to stop any downstream networks from injecting packets with faked or spoofed addresses into the internet. Although this doesn't stop an attack from occurring, it does make it much easier to track down the source of the attack and terminate the attack quickly. Most IDS, firewalls, and routers provide network ingress filtering capabilities. Rate limiting network traffic. A number of routers on the market today have features that let you limit the amount of bandwidth some types of traffic can consume. 
this is sometimes referred to as a traffic shaping intrusion detection systems use an intrusion detection system to detect attackers who are communicating with slave master or agent machine doing so lets you know whether a machine in your network is being used to launch a known attack but probably won't detect new variation of these attacks or the tools that implement them dos scanning tools find ddos is a tool that scans a local system that likely contains a ddos program it can detect several non dos attack tools sara gathers information about remote hosts and network by examining network services this includes information about the network information services as well as potential security flaws such as incorrectly set up or configured network services or well known bugs in the system or network utilized system software vulnerabilities listed in the common vulnerabilities and exposures database and weak policy decision rid is a free scanning tool that detects the presence of trino tfn or stage dreadnought clients hello everyone welcome to my lecture session hijacking is when a hacker takes control of a user session after the user has successfully authenticated with a server session hijacking involves an attack identifying the current session ids of a client slash server communication and taking over the client session sequence prediction tcp is a connection oriented protocol responsible for resembling streams of packets into their original intended order every packet has to be assigned a unique session number that enables the receiving machine to resemble the stream of packets into their original and intended order this unique number is known as a sequence number if the packets arrive out of order as happens regularly over the internet then the sn is used to stream the packets correctly as just illustrated the system initially in a tcp session transmits a packet with the sync bit set this is called a synchronized packet and includes the client's isn the isn is a shadow randomly generated number with over 4 billion possible combinations yet it is statistically possible for it to repeat when the ack packet is sent each machine uses the sn from the packet being acknowledged plus an increment this not only properly confirms receipt of a specific packet but also tells the sender the next expected tcp packet sn within the three way handshake the increment value is number 1 in normal data communication the increment value equals the size of the data in bytes hacking tools used to perform session hijacking do sequence number prediction to successfully perform a tcp sequence prediction attack the hacker must sniff the traffic between two system next the hacker or the hacking tool must successfully guess the sn or locate an isn to calculate the next sequence number this process can be more difficult than it sounds because packets travel very fast when the hacker is unable to sniff the connection it becomes much more difficult to guess the next sn for this reason most session hijacking tools include features to permit sniffing the packets to determine the sns hackers generate packets using a spoofed ip address of the system that had a session with the target system the hacking tools issue packets with the sns that the target system is expecting but the hackers packets must arrive before the packets from the trusted system whose connection is being ha- hijacked this is accomplished by flooding the trusted system with packets or sending an rst packet to the trusted system so that it is unavailable to send packets to the target system hacking tools zugarnet is a network sniffer that can be used to hijack tcp sessions it runs on linux operating system and can be used to watch for wall network traffic or it can be given a keyword such as password to look for the program shows all active network connections and the attacker can then choose a session to hijack 
Hunt is a program that can be used to sniff and hijack active session on a network. Hunt performs connection management, addresses resolution protocol, spoofing, resetting of connection, monitoring of connections, media access control, addresses discovery and sniffing of TCP traffic. TTY Watcher is a session hijacking utility that allows the hijacker to return the stolen session to the valid user as it though it was never hijacked. TTY Watcher is only for Sun Solar Ray systems. IP Watcher is a session hijacking tool that lets an attacker monitor connection and take over a session. This program can monitor wall connection on a network, allowing the attackers to watch an exact copy of a session in real time. T-Site is a session monitoring and hijacking tool for Windows that can assist when an attempt at a network break-in or compromise occurs. With T-Site, a system administrator can monitor all network connections in real time and observe any suspicious activity that takes place. T-Site can also hijack any TCP session on the network for security reasons and guard systems license this software only to predetermined IP addresses. Dangers posed by session hijacking TCP session hijacking is a dangerous attack. Most systems are vulnerable to it because they use TCP slash IP as their primary communication protocol. Newer operating systems have attempted to secure themselves from session hijacking by using shadow random number generators to calculate the ISN, making the sequence number harder to guess. However, this security measure is ineffective if the attacker is able to sniff packets, which gives all the information required to perform this attack. The following are session why it's important for a CEH to be aware of session hijacking. 1. Most computers are vulnerable. 2. Few countermeasures are available to adequately protect against it. 3. Session hijacking attacks are simple to launch. 4. Hijacking is dangerous because of the information that can be gathered during the attack. Denial of service attacks are used to render a system or network unusable and are considered attacks against the availability of the user data. When other hacking attempts fail, a hacker may resort to DOS attacks as a way of attacking the system. Even though the data may not be acquired by a hacker using DOS, the hacker can prevent legitimate users from accessing the data. DOS attacks and especially DDoS attacks are difficult to counter measures. The best option is to attempt to prevent the attacks by using traffic filtering at the firewall or an IDS. Preventing Session Hijacking To defend against Session Hijacking attacks, a network should employ several defenses. The most effective protection is encryption, such as Internet Protocol Security. This also depends against any other attack vectors that depend on sniffing. Attackers may be able to passively monitor your connection, but they won't be able to interpret the encrypted data. Other countermeasures include using encrypted applications such as Secure Cell, SSH and Encrypted Telnet, and Secure Sockets Layer, SSL for HTTPS traffic. You can help prevent session hijacking by reducing the potential methods of gaining access to your network. For example, by eliminating remote access to internal systems. If the network has remote users who need to connect to carry out their duties, then use virtual private network that have been secured with tunneling protocols and encryption. The use of multiple safety nets is always the best countermeasures to any potential threat. Employing any one countermeasures may not be enough, but using them together to secure your enterprise will make the attack success rate minimal for anyone but the most professional and dedicated attacker. The following is a checklist of countermeasures that should be employed to prevent session hijacking. 1. Use encryption. 2. Use a secure protocol. 3. 
limit incoming connections, 4. Minimize remote access, 5. Have a strong authentication, 6. Educate your employees, 7. Maintain different username and passwords for different accounts, 8. Use Ethernet switches rather than hubs to prevent session hijacking attacks. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. SQL injection and buffer overflows are hacking techniques used to exploit weaknesses in applications. When programs are written, some parameter used in the creation of the application's code can leave weaknesses in the program. SQL injection and buffer overflows are covered in the same lecture because they both are methods used to attack application and are generally caused by programming flaws. Generally the purpose of SQL injection is to convince the application to run SQL code that was not intended. SQL injection is a hijack hacking method used to attack SQL databases whereas buffer overflows can exist in many different types of application. SQL injection and buffer overflows are similar exploits in that they are both usually delivered via a user input field. The input field is where a user may enter a username and password on a website, add data to a URL, or perform a search for a keyword in another application. The SQL injection vulnerability is caused primarily by unverified or unsanitized user input via these fields. Both SQL server injection and buffer overflow vulnerabilities are caused by the same issue. Invalid parameters that are not verified by the application. If programs don't take the time to validate the variables, a user can enter into a variable field. The results can be serious and unpredictable. Sophisticated hackers can exploit this vulnerability, causing an execution fault and shutdown of the system or application, or a command cell to be executed for the hacker. SQL injection and buffer overflow countermeasures are designed to utilize secure programming methods by changing the variables used by the application code. Weaknesses in application can be greatly minimized. As a CAH, it's important for you to be able to define SQL injection and understand the steps a hacker takes to conduct a SQL injection attack. In addition, you should know SQL server vulnerabilities as well as countermeasures to SQL injection attacks. SQL injection SQL injection occurs when an application processes use provided data to create a SQL statement without first validating the input. The user input is then submitted to a web application database server for execution. When successfully exploited, SQL injection can give an attacker access to database content or allow the hacker to remotely execute system commands. In the worst case scenario, the hacker can take control of the server that is hosting the database. The exploit can give a hacker to a remote cell into the server file system. The impact of a SQL injection attack depends on where the vulnerability is in the code, how easy it is to exploit the vulnerability, and what level of access the application has to be database. Theoretically, SQL injection can occur in any type of application, but it is most commonly associated with web application because they are most often attacked, as previously discussed web hacking, Google web servers, web application vulnerabilities, and web-based password cracking techniques. Web applications are easy target because they, by their very nature, they are open to being accessed from the internet. You should have a basic understanding of how databases work and how SQL commands are used to access the information in the databases prior to attempting the CEH exam. During a web application SQL injection attack, 
malicious code is inserted into a web from field or the website's code to make a system execute a command shell or other arbitrary commands just as a legitimate user enters queries and addition to the SQL database via web form. The hacker can insert commands to the SQL server through the same web from field. For example, an arbitrary command from a hacker might open a command prompt or display a table from the database. A database table may co contain personal information such as credit card numbers, social security numbers, or passwords. SQL servers are very common database servers and used by many organizations to store confidential data. This makes a SQL server a high value target and therefore a system that is very attractive to hackers. Determining SQL injection vulnerabilities While performing a black hat penetration test on a corporate network, a security tester Tom found a custom application on one of the publicly accessible web servers. Since this was a black hat test, Tom did not have access to the source code to see how the program had been cheat created. But after performing some information gathering, he was able to determine that the server was running Microsoft Internet Information Server Syncs along with ASP.NET and this suggested that the database was Microsoft SQL Server. The login page of the web application had a username, a password field and a forgotten password link which ended up being the easiest way into the system. A forgotten password link works by looking in the user database for the user's email address and sending an email containing the password to that address. So to determine if the forgotten password link was vulnerable to SQL injection, Tom entered a single code as part of the data is the forgotten password field. The purpose was to see if the application would construct a SQL string literally without sanitizing the user input. When submitting the form with a quota in the email address, he received a 500 error and this suggested that the user input was being parsed literally. Finding a SQL injection vulnerability before launching a SQL injection attack, the hacker determines whether the configuration of the database and related tables and variables is vulnerable. The steps to determine the SQL server's vulnerability are as follows. Using your web browser, search for a website that uses a login page or other database input or query fields. Look for web pages that display the post or get HTML commands by checking the site source code. Do it. 2. Test the SQL server using single quotes. Doing so indicates whether the user input variable is sanitized or interpreted literally by the server. If the server responds with an error message that says use a is equal to a or something similar then it's most likely susceptible to a SQL injection attack. Use the select command to retrieve data from the database or the insert command to add information to the database. These commands and similar variation may allow a user to bypass a login depending on the structure of the database. When entered in a form field, the commands may return many rows in a table or even an entire database table because the SQL server is interpreting the terms literally. The double dash says near the end of the command tell SQL to ignore the rest of the command as a comment. SQL injection attacks are used by hackers to achieve certain results. Some SQL exploits will produce valuable user data stored in the database and some are just uh, precursors to other attacks. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. The purpose of SQL injection. SQL injection attacks are used by hackers to achieve certain results. Some SQL exploits will produce valuable user data stored in the database and some are just precursors to other attacks. The following are the most common purpose of a SQL injection attack. 
identifying SQL injection vulnerability. The purpose is to prove a web application to discover which parameter and user input fields are vulnerable to SQL injection. Performing database fingerprinting. The purpose is to discover the type and version of database that a web application is using and fingerprint the database. Knowing the type and versions of the database used by a web application allow an attacker to craft database specific attacks. Determining database schema to correctly extract data from a database. The attacker often needs to know database schema information such as table names, column names, and column data types. This information can be used in a follow-on attack. Extracting data. These types of attacks employ techniques that will extract data values from the database depending on the type of web application. This information could be sensitive and highly desirable to the attacker. Adding or modifying data. The purpose is to add or change information in a database. Performing denial of services. These attacks are performed to shut down access to a web application, thus denying service to other users. Attacks involving locking or dropping database tables also fall under this category. Evading detection. This category refers to certain attack techniques that are employed to avoid auditing and detection. Bypassing authentication. The purpose is to allow the hacker attacker to bypass database and application authentication mechanisms. Bypassing such mechanisms could allow the attacker to assume the rights and privileges associated with another application user. Executing remote commands. These types of attacks attempts to execute arbitrary commands on the database. These commands can be stored procedures or functions available to database users. Performing privilege Escalation. These attacks take advantage of implementation errors or logical flaws in the database in order to escalate the privileges of the attacker. SQL injection using dynamic strings. Most SQL applications do a specific predictable job. Many functions of a SQL database receive static user input where the only variable is the user input fields. Such statements do not change from execution to execution. They are commonly called static SQL statements. However, some program must build and process a variety of SQL statements at runtime. In many cases, the full text of the statement is unknown until application execution. Such statements can and probably will change from execution to execution. So they are called dynamic SQL statements. Dynamic SQL is an enhanced form of SQL that, unlike standard SQL, facilitates the automatic generation and execution of program statements. Dynamic SQL is a term used to mean SQL code that is generated by the web application before it is executed. Dynamic SQL is a flexible and powerful tool for creating SQL strings. It can be helpful when you find it necessary to write code that can adjust to varying databases, conditions, or servers. Dynamic SQL also make it easier to automate tasks that are repeated many times in a web application. A hacker can attack a web-based authentication form using SQL injection through the use of dynamic strings. For example, the underlining code for a web authentication form on a web server may look like a hacker can exploit the SQL injection vulnerability by entering a login and password in the web form. The, the SQL application would build a command string from this input. This is an example of SQL injection. This query will return all rows from the user's database, regardless of whether Kimberly is a real username in the database or Grabs is a legitimate password. This is due to the OR statement appended to the WHERE clause. The comparison is equal to will always return a true result, making the overall WHERE clause 
evaluated true for or all rows in the table. This will enable the hacker to log in with any username and password. SQL injection countermeasures. The cause of SQL injection vulnerabilities is relatively simple and well understood. Insufficient validation of user input. To address this problem, defensive coding practice such as encoding user input and validation can be used when programming applications. It is a laborious and time-consuming process to check all applications for SQL injection vulnerabilities. When the implementing SQL injection countermeasures, review source code for the following programming weaknesses. Single quotes, lack of input validation. The first countermeasures for preventing a SQL injection attack are minimizing the privileges of a user connection to the database and enforcing strong password for SA and administrator accounts. You should also disable verbose or explanatory error messages so no more information than necessary is sent to the hacker. Such information could help them determine whether the SQL server is vulnerable. Remember that one of the purposes of SQL injection is to gain additional information as to which parameters are susceptible to attack. Buffer overflows. As a CEH, you must be able to identify different types of buffer overflows. You should also know how to detect a buffer overflow vulnerability and understand the steps a hacker may use to perform a stake-based overflow attack types of buffer overflows and methods of detection. Buffer overflows are exploits that hackers use against an operating system or application. Like SQL injection attacks, they are usually targeted at user input fields. A buffer overflow exploit causes a system to fail by overloading memory or executing a command cell or arbitrary code on the target system. A buffer overflow vulnerability is caused by a lack of bonds checking or a lack of input validation sanitization in a variable field such as one a web form. If the application doesn't check or validate the size or format of a variable before sending it to the be stored in memory, an overflow vulnerability exists. The two types of buffer overflows are stake based and help based. The stake and the heap are storage location for user supplied variables within a running program. Variables are stored in the stake or heap until the program needs them. Stakes are static locations of memory address space, whereas heaps are dynamic memory address space that occur while a program is running. A call stake or stake is used to keep track of where in the programming code the execution pointer should return after each portion of the code is executed. A stake based buffer overflow attack occurs when the memory assigned to each execution routine is overflowed. As a consequence of both types of buffer overflows, a program can open a cell or command prompt or stop the execution of a program. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture, cryptography and uh, encryption techniques. Cryptography is the study of encryption and encryption algorithms. In a practical sense, encryption is the conversion of message from a comprehensible from, uh, form into an incomprehensible one and back again. The purpose of encryption is to render data unreadable by interceptors or uh, you has droppers who do not know the secret of how to decrypt the message. Encryption attempts to ensure secrecy in communications. In cryptography defines the techniques used in encryption. This lecture will discuss encryption algorithms and cryptography. Cryptography and encryption techniques. Encryption can be used to encrypt data while it is transit or while it's stored on a hard drive. Cryptography is the study of protecting information by mathematically scrambling the data so it cannot be de deciphered without knowledge of the mathematical formula used to encrypt it. 
this mathematical formula is known as the encryption algorithm cryptography is composed of two words crypt meaning secret or hidden and graphy meaning writing cryptography literally means secret or hidden writing clear text is the readable and understandable data and cheaper text is the scrambled text as a result of the encryption process cheaper text should be unreadable and so no repeatable pattern to ensure the confidentiality of the data clear text and cheaper text are shown below there are three critical elements to data security confidentiality integrity and authentication are known as the cia triad data encryption provides confidentiality meaning the data can only be read by authorized users message hashing provides integrity which ensures the data sent is the same data received and the information was not modified in transit message digital signatures provide authentication as well as integrity message encryption and digital signatures together provide confidentiality authentication and integrity encryption algorithms can use simple methods of scrambling characters such as substitution replacing characters with other characters and transposition changing order of characters encryption algorithms are mathematical calculation based on substitution and transposition Adverse cipher used by the ancient Hebrews. Uh, Adverse is a substitution cipher and works by replacing each letter used with another letter the same distance away from the end of the alphabet. Vigneur cipher, 16th century French cryptographer Blaise de Vigneur created a polyalphabetic cipher to overcome the shortcomings of simple substitution cipher. The Vigor cipher uses a table to increase the available substitution values and make the substitution more complex. The substitution table consists of columns and rows labeled A to Z to get cipher text. First, you select the column of plain text and then you select the row of the key. The intersection of row and column is called cipher text. To decode cipher text, you select the row of the key and find the intersection that is equal to cipher text. Varnam cipher. In 1917, AT&T Bell Labs engineer Gilbert Varnam sought to improve the Vigneur cipher and ended up creating the Varnam cipher or one-time pad. The Varnam cipher is an encryption algorithm where the plain text is combined with a random key or pad that is the same length as the message. One time pads are the only algorithm that is probably unbreakable by brute force. Types of encryption The two primary types of encryption are symmetric and asymmetric key encryption. Symmetric key encryption means both sender and receiver use the same secret key to encrypt and decrypt the data. A secret key which can be a number, a word or just a string of random letters is applied to the text of a message to change the content in a particular way. This might be as simple as shifting each letter by a number of places in the alphabet. As long as both sender and recipient know the secret key. They can encrypt and decrypt all messages that use this key. The drawback to symmetric key encryption is there is no secure way to share the key between multiple systems. Systems that use symmetric key encryption need to use an offline method to transfer the key from one system to another. This is not practical in a large environment such as the internet, where the clients and servers are not located in the same physical place. The strength of symmetric key encryption is fast bulk encryption. Weaknesses of symmetric key encryption include key distribution, scalability, limited security, the fact that it does not provide non reputation meaning the sender's identity can be proven. Examples of symmetric algorithms are follows. 
DES data encryption standard, 3DES AES advanced encryption standard, IDEA international data encryption algorithm, TOFIS RC4 revised CPAR4, asymmetric keeps cryptography was created to address the weakness of symmetric key management and distribution but there is a problem with secret key how can they be exchanged securely over an inherently insecure network such as the internet anyone who knows the secret key can decrypt the message so it is important to keep the secret key secure asymmetric encryption is a two related key known as a key pair a public key is made available to anyone who might want to send you an encrypted message. A second private key is kept secret so that only you know it. Any message, text, binary files or documents that are encrypted by using the public key can only be decrypted by using the matching private key. Any message that is encrypted by using the private key can only be decrypted by using the matching public key. This means that you do not have to worry about passing public keys over the internet as they are by nature available to anyone. A problem with asymmetric encryption however is that it is lower than uh, symmetric encryption. It requires far more processing power to both encrypt and decrypt the content of the message. The relation between the two keys in asymmetric key encryption is based on complex mathematical formulas. One method of creating the key pair is to use factorization of prime numbers. Another is to use decrypt logarithms. Asymmetric encryption systems are based on one-way functions that act as a trapdoor. Essentially, the encryption is one way in that the same key cannot decrypt message it encrypted. The associated private key provides information to make decryption feasible. The information about the function is included in the public key, whereas information about the trapdoor is in the private key. Anyone who has the private key knows the trapdoor function and can compute the public key. To use asymmetric encryption, there needs to be a method for transferring public keys. The typical technique is to use X.509 digital certificates. A certificate is a file of information that identifies a user or a server and contains the organization name, the organization that use issued the certificate and the user's email address, country and public key. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. Stream ciphers versus block ciphers. Block ciphers and stream ciphers are the two types of encryption ciphers. Block ciphers are encryption ciphers that operate by encrypting a fixed amount or block of data. The most common block size is 64 bits of data. This chunk or block of data is encrypted as one unit of clear text. When a block cipher is used for encryption and decryption, the message is divided into blocks of bits. Blocks are then put through one or more of the following scrambling methods. Substitution, transposition, confusion, diffusion, S-boxes. A stream cipher encrypts single bits of data as a continuous stream of data bits. Stream ciphers typically execute at a higher speed than block ciphers and are suited for hardware uses. The stream cipher then combines a plain text bit with a pseudo random cipher bit stream by means of an XOR operation. The XOR process is to compare the plain text and key one bit at a time and based on the XOR logic create cipher text. If the plain text and secret key are the same bit, the result is a zero. If they are different such as one and zero, then the resulting encrypted bit is a one. Generating public and private keys. When a client and a server use asymmetric cryptography, both create their own pairs of keys for a total of four keys. The server's public key, the server's private key, the client's public key, and the client's private key. A system's key pair has a mathematical relationship that allows data encrypted with one of the keys to be decrypted with the other key. These keys have a mathematical relationship based on factoring prime numbers such that each key can be used to decrypt data encrypted with 
the other key when a client and a server want to mutually authenticate and share information they each send their own public key to the remote system but they never share their private keys each message is encrypted with the receiver's public key oh, only the receiver's private key can decrypt the message the server would encrypt a message to the client using the client's public key the only key that can decrypt the message is held by the client which ensures confidentiality a public key infrastructure is necessary in order to create digital certificates pki is a framework that consists of hardware software policies that exist to manage create store and distribute keys and digital certificates additionally a complete pki solution involves symmetric algorithms asymmetric algorithms hashing and digital authentication one of the major strengths of public key encryption is its ability to facilitate communication between parties previously unknown to each other a process that is made possibly by the pki hierarchy of trust relationships the important parts of the pki infrastructure are as follows digital certificates certificate authorities certificate generation and destruction key management cas are the glue that binds the public infrastructure together they are essentially neutral third party organizations that provide notarization services for digital certificates to obtain a digital certificate from a reputable ca you must identify and prove identity other uses for encryption integrity is one of the components of the cia triad and ensures that information remains unchanged and is in its true original form a hash is a common method of providing integrity of a message a hash is the conversation of a string of characters into a shorter fixed length value that represents the original it is similar to a shorthand version of the full data common hashing algorithms for digital signatures include sha1 md5 uh, ripemd160 if you have downloaded a file from the internet you may be concerned that the file is not complete or was corrupted one of the ways to ensure the file sent is the same file received is through the md5 hashing algorithms md5 hashes are fingerprints of files you can compare the fingerprints of two files to see if the file themselves are the same you have to have the correct fingerprints for a file to compare the file you received with the original otherwise you cannot tell if your file has integrity when you download a large file it may contain another file called md5 sum or something similar this file contains the correct fingerprints dragging an md5 sum file onto win md5 causes the fingerprints to be compared automatically the md5 sum program allows you to compute the md5 hashes of files it also makes it easy to compare the fingerprints against the correct fingerprints stored in an md5 sum file red hat for example provides md5 sum files for all of its large downloadable files when you perform hashing two messages with the same digest are extremely unlikely however if this does occur and two messages produce the same hash it is called a collision collisions allow for uh, cryptographic attacks against the algorithm cryptography algorithms algorithms vary in key length from 40 bits to 448 bits the longer the key length the stronger the encryption algorithm using brute force to crack a key of 40 bits takes from 1.4 minutes to 0.2 seconds depending on the strength of the processing computer in comparison a 64 bit key requires between 50 years and 37 days to break again depending on the speed of the processor currently any key with a length over 250 c 6 bits is considered uncrackable message digest 5 
secret hash algorithm rc4 rc5 and blowfish are all names for different mathematical algorithms used for encryption as a ceh you need to be familiar with these algorithms md5 md5 is a hashing algorithm that uses a random length input to generate a 128 bit digest it is popular to create a digital signature to accompany documents and emails to prove the integrity of the source the digital signature process involves the creation of an md5 message digest of the document which is then encrypted by the sender's private key md5 message digests are encrypted by a private key in the digital signature process sha ssa is also a message digest which generates a 160 bit digest of encrypted data sha takes slightly longer than md5 and is considered a stronger encryption digital signatures are based on public key cryptography and used to verify the authenticity and integrity of a message a digital signature is created by passing a message contents through a hashing algorithm the hashed value is then encrypted with the sender's private key upon receiving the message the recipient decrypts the encrypted sum and then recalculates the expected message hash value should match in order to ensure validity of the message proof that it was sent by the party believed to have sent it proof that only that party has access to the private key digital signature process are shown below hello everyone welcome to my lecture password management passwords are often the path of least resistance on pin testing engagements a client with a strong security program can fix missing windows patches and out of date software but the users themselves can't be patched we will look at attacking users when we discuss social engineering later but if we can correctly guess or calculate a user's password we may be able to avoid involving the user in the attack at all in this lecture we will look at how to use tools to automate running services on our targets and sending usernames and password password management companies are working up to the inherent risk of password based authentication brute force attacks and educated cases are both serious risks to weak passwords many organizations use biometric uh, or two-factor authentication to mitigate this risk given web service such as gmail and dropbox offer two-factor authentication in which the user provides a password as well as a second value such as the digits on an electronic token if two-factor authentication is not available using a strong password is imperative for account security because all that stands between the attackers and sensitive data may come down to a simple string strong passwords are long use characters from multiple complexity classes and are not based on a dictionary word the passwords we use in this lecture are deliberately terrible but unfortunately many users don't behave much better when it comes to passwords organization can force users to create strong passwords but as passwords become more complex they become harder to remember users are likely to leave a password that they can't remember in a file on their computer in their smartphone or even on a post-it note because it's just easier to keep up track them that way of course password that can be discovered lying around in plain text undermine the security of using a strong password another cardinal sin of good password management is using the same password on many sites in a worst case scenario the ceo's weak password for a compromised web forum might just be the very same one for his or her corporate access to financial documents password reuse in something to bear in mind will performing password attacks you may find the same password work on multiple systems and sites password management presents a difficult problem for it staff and will likely continue to be a fruitful avenue for attacks cars unless or until password based authentication is phased out entirely in favor of another model one line password attacks 
just as we used automated scans to find vulnerabilities we can use scripts to automatically attempt to log into services and find valid credentials we will use tools designed for automating online password attacks or guessing password until the server responds with a successful login these tools use a technique called brute forcing tools that use brute forcing try every possible username and password combination and given enough time they will find valid credentials the trouble with brute forcing is that as stronger passwords are used the time it takes to brute force them moves from hours to years and even beyond your natural <coughs> lifetime we can probably find working credentials more easily by feeding educated guesses about the correct passwords into an automated login tool dictionary words are easy to remember so despite the security warnings many users incorporate them into passwords slightly more security conscious users might put some numbers at the end of their password or maybe even an exclamation point word list before you can use a tool to guess passwords you need a list of credential to try if you don't know the name of the user account you want to crack or you just want to crack as many accounts as possible you can provide a user name list for the password guessing tool to uh, iterate through user list when creating a user list first try to determine the client's username scheme for instance if we are trying to break into employee email accounts figure out the pattern the email addresses follow are they first name dot last name just a first name or last name else you can look for good username candidates on list of common first or last names of course the guesses will be even more likely to succeed if you can find the names of your target actual employees if a company uses a first initial followed by a last name for the username scheme and they have an employee named john smith J. Smith is likely a valid username. Once you have created your list, save the sample usernames in a text file in Kali Linux. Like our username list, this password list is just a very short example uh, and one that hopefully wouldn't find the correct passwords for too many accounts in the real world. On a real engagement, you should use a much longer word list. There are many good password lists available on the internet. Good places to look for word lists include http slash slash packetstormsecurity.com slash cracker slash word list. A few password lists are also built into Kali Linux. This is a compressed word list. If you unzip the file with the Gunzip Linux utility, you will have about 140 MB of possible passwords, which should give you a pretty good start. Also, some of the password cracking tools in Kali come with sample word list. For example, the John the Reaper tool. For better results, customize your word list for a particular target by including additional word. You can make educated guesses based on information you gather about employees online. Information about spouses, children, pets, and hobbies may put you on the right track. Guessing usernames and passwords with Hydra. If you have a set of credentials that you would like to try against a running service that requires a login, you can input them manually one by one or use a tool to automate the process. Hydra is an online password guessing tool that can be used to test usernames and passwords for running services following the traditional of naming security tools after the victims or Hercules levers Hydra is named for the mythical Greek serpent with many heads use Hydra to guess usernames and passwords by running through our username and password files to search for valid pop3 credentials on our windows xp target this command uses the l flag to specify the username file the p for the password list file and specifies the protocol pop3 hydra finds that user georgia's password is password at same on georgia for using such an insecure password 
sometimes you will know that a specific password uh, username exists on a server and you just need a valid password to go with it for example we use the smtp vrfy verb to find uh, valid usernames on the sl mail server on the windows xp target as you can see in district 9 to 6 we can use the one uh, yeah, I flag instead of yell to specify one particular username. We specify the POP3 protocol and provide the username and password when prompt. Hydra can perform online password guessing against a range of services. For example, uh, here we use the credential we found with Hydra to log in with Netcat. One way to avoid having your login attempts to noticed is to try to guess a password before trying to log in, as you will learn later. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. Types of cells in the list of compatible payloads, a range of options including common cells, meter printer, a speech API, or execution of a single Windows command. Meterpreter or otherwise cells fall into two categories, bind and reverse. Bind cells. A bind cell instructs the target machine to open a command cell and listen on a local port. The attack machine then connects to the target machine on the listening port. However, with the advent of firewalls, the effectiveness of bind cells has fallen because any correctly configured firewall will block traffic to some random port like 4444 reverse cell or reverse cell on the other hand actively pushes a connection back to the attack machine rather than waiting for an incoming connection in this case on our attack machine we open a local port and listen for a connection from our target because this reverse connection is more likely to make it through a firewall setting a payload manual let's select a windows reversal for our payload set a payload the same way you set the r host option because this is a reverse cell we need to tell tar the target where to send the cell specifically we need to give it to the uh, ip address of the attack machine and the port we will listen on running show options again msfcli now for another way to interact with metasploit the command line interface msfcli msfcli is particularly useful when using metasploit inside scripts and for testing metasploit modules that you are developing because it lets you run a model with a quick one line command getting help to run msf cli first exit uh, msf console by entering exit or just open another linux console msf cli is in our path so we can call it from anywhere unlike with msf console when using msf cli we can tell metasploit everything it needs to know to run our exploit in just one command Luckily, MSF CLI has some modes to help us build the final command. For example, the zero mode shows the select module options and P shows the computable payloads. Creating standalone payloads with MSF Venom. In 2011, MSF Venom was added to Metasploit. Prior to MSF Venom, the tools MSF Payload and MSF Encode could use together to create standalone encode metasploit payloads in a variety of output formats such as Windows executables and ASP pages. With the introduction of MSF Venom, the functionality of MSF payload and MSF encode was combined into a single tool. Though MSF payload and MSF are still included in Metasploit to view MSF help so far with a metasploit our goal has been to exploit a vulnerability on the target system and take control of the machine now we will do something a little different instead of relying on a missing patch or other security issue we are hoping to exploit the one security issue that may never be fully patched the users 
MSF Venom allows you to build in standalone payloads to run on a target system in an attempt to exploit the user whether through a social engineering attack or by uploading a payload to a vulnerable server. When, we w when all else fails, the user can often be a way in choosing a payload to list all the available payloads. Enter MSF Venom um, 1 payloads. We will use one of Metasploit Meterpreter payloads, which provides a reverse connection with a Meterpreter shell, choosing an output format. Now tell MSF Venom which output format to use. We Will we be running this payload from a Windows executable or do we want to make an ASP file that can be uploaded to a web server we have gained right access to? But if you run this command as is, you will see garbage printed to the console. Well, this is technically our executable payload. It does do us much good. Instead, let's redirect the output to an executable file. There is no output to the screen, but if we run the file command on our newly created executable file, we see that it's Windows executable that will run on any Windows system as long as user attempts to run it. Serving payloads. One good way to serve up payloads is to host them on a web server, distinguish them as something useful, and lure users into downloading them. For this example, we will host our Metasploit executable on our Kali machines, build in Apache server and browse to the file from our target machine. Now switch to your Windows XP target and open Internet Explorer. Browse to http slash slash 192.168.20.9 slash chapter 4 example.exn. Download the file. But before we run the file, we have one loose end to deal with. So far, when attempting to exploit our target machine, Metasploit set up our payload handlers and send the exploit. When I used MSF in console to exploit the MS08067 vulnerability with a reverse shell payload, Metasploit first set up a handler listening on port 4444 for the reverse connection. But up to this point, we have nothing listening for a reverse connection from the payload we created with MSF Venom using an auxiliary module. Metasploit was first conceived as an exploitation framework and it continues to be a stop contender in the world of exploitation. But in the ensuing years, its functionality has grown in about as many directions as there are creative minds working on it. I sometimes quip that Metasploit can do everything except my laundry and I am currently working on a module for that. Dirty socks aside, in addition to exploitation, Metasploit has modules to aid in every phase of pin testing. Some modules that are not used for exploitation are known as auxiliary modules. They include things like vulnerability scanners, fuzzers, and even denial of services modules. A good rule of thumb to remember is that exploit modules use a payload and auxiliary modules do not. For example, when we first use the Windows slash SMB slash MS08067 NetPy exploit module earlier in this lecture, one of the options was SMB pipe. The default value for that option was browser. Let the options for this module are a bit different from what we have seen so far. I instead of our host, we have our hosts which allows us to specify more than one remote host to run the module against. Auxiliaries can be run against multiple hosts, whereas exploits can exploit only one system at a time. We also see options for SMB user, SMB pass and SMB domain. Because our Windows XP target is not part of any domain, we can leave the SMB domain at the default value, workgroup. We can leave the SMB user and SMB pass values blank. And the threads option also uh, allows us to control the speed of Metasploit by having our model run in multiple threads. We are scanning only one system in this case, so the default value of one thread will work fine. The module 
audits the listening SMB pipes on our Windows XP target. As it turns out, the browser pipe is the only available pipe because this pipe is listening. This is the correct value for the SMB pipe option in the Windows slash SMB slash MS08067 NetPy exploit model we used earlier in this lecture. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. The first step of the hacking process is gathering information on a target. Information gathering, also known as uh, footprinting, is the process of gathering all available information about an organization. In the age of the internet, information is available in bits and pieces from many different sources. Seemingly insignificant bytes of information can be enlightening when pieced together, which is the purpose of this information gathering. Footprint can be effected in identifying high value targets, which is what hackers will be looking for to focus their efforts. A hacker uses information gathering techniques to determine organization high value targets where the most valuable information resides. Not only does information gathering help identify where the information is located, but it also helps determine the best way to gain access to the targets. This information can then be used to identify and eventually hack target systems. Many people jump right into running hacking tools. But information gathering is critical in minimizing the chance of detection and assessing where to spend the most time and effort. Social engineering can also be used to obtain more information about an organization, which can ultimately lead to an attack. Social engineering as an information gathering tool is highly effective at exploiting the most vulnerable asset in an organization. The people, human interaction, and the willingness to give our information make people an excellent source of information. Good social engineering techniques can speed up the hacking process and in most cases will yield information much more easily. Recon reconnaissance The term reconnaissance comes from the military and means to actively seek an enemy's intentions by collecting and gathering information about an enemy's composition and capabilities via direct observation usually by scouts or military intelligence personnel trained in surveillance in the world of ethical hacking reconnaissance applies to the process of information gathering reconnaissance is a catch-all term for watching the hacking target and gathering information about how when and where they do things by identifying patterns of behavior of people or systems, an enemy could find and exploit a loophole using reconnaissance to gain physical access. Every weekend at 3 p.m., the Federal Express drives stops at the loading dock of a building where the offices of Medical Associates uh, institution are located. When the driver backs the trucks up to the rear door of the building, he processes the buzzer and lets the security guard know he is at the door. Because the building's security personnel recognize the driver as he comes to the door every day around the same time for pickup and drop off, they remotely uh, unlock the door and allow the driver to enter. A hacker is watching this process from a car in the parking lot and takes notes of the procedure to gain physical entry into the building. The next day, the hacker carries a large cardboard box toward the door just as the Federal Express driver has been given entry to the building. The driver naturally holds the door for the hacker because he is carrying what appears to be a heavy large box. They exchange pleasantries and the hacker heads for the elevator up to the medical associates offices. The hacker leaves the box in the hallway of the building as he heads to his target office. Once he reaches the front desk of medical associate office, he asks to speak with the office manager whose name he previously looked up on the company website. The receptionist leaves her desk to go get the office manager and the hacker reaches over the desk and plugs a USB drive containing hacking tools into the back of her computer. Because the computer is not locked with a password, he double clicks on the USB drive icon and it's uh, sli silently installed. 
the hacking software on the receptionist computer. He removes the USB drive and quickly exit the office suite and building and the test. This is an example of how reconnaissance and understanding the pattern of people's behavior can enable a hacker to gain physical access to a target. Understanding competitive intelligence. Competitive intelligence means information gathering about competitors, products, marketing, and technologies. Most competitive intelligence is non intrusive to the company, being investigated, and is uh, benign in nature. It's used for product comparison or as a sales and marketing uh, tactic to better understanding how competitors are positioning their products or services. Several tools exist for the purpose of competitive intelligence gathering and can be used by hackers to gather information about a potential target. Another useful tool to perform competitive intelligence and information gathering is the EDGAR database. This is a database of all the SEC feelings for public companies. Information can be gathered by reviewing the SEC fillings for contact names and addresses. Footprinting. Footprinting is defined as the process of creating a blueprint or map of an organization network and systems. Information gathering is also known as footprinting and organization. Footprinting begins by determining the target system, application or physical location of the target. Once this information is known, specific information about the organization is gathered using non intrusive methods. For example, the organization's own web page may provide a personal directory or a list of employee bios, which may prove useful if the hacker needs, needs to use a social engineering attack to reach the objective. The information the hacker is looking for during the footprinting uh, phase is anything that gives clues as to the network architecture, server and application types where valuable data is stored. Before an attack or exploit can be launched, and the operating system and version as well as application types must be uncovered so the most effective attack can be launched against the target. Here are some of the pieces of information to be gathered about a target during footprinting. Domain name, network blocks, network services and applications, system architecture, intuition detection system, authentication mechanisms, specific IP addresses, access control mechanisms, phone numbers, contact addresses. Once this information is compiled, it can give a hacker better insight into the organization where valuable information is stored now and how it can be accessed. Information gathering methodology. Information gathering can be broken into several logical steps. See figure 2.1. Footprinting is performed during the first two steps of unearthing initial information and locating the network range. Footprinting tools. Footprinting can be done using hacking tools, either applications or website, which allows the hacker to locate information passively. By using these footprinting tools, a hacker can gain some basic information on our footprint, the target. By fast footprinting the target, a hacker can eliminate tools that will not work against the target system or network. For example, if a graphics design firm uses all machine TOS computers, then all hacking software that targets uh, Windows systems can be eliminated through pending not only speeds up the hacking process by eliminating chart and tool sets but also minimize the chance of detection as fewer hacking attempts can be made by using the right tool for the job. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. Footprinting tools. Footprinting can be done using hacking tools, either applications or websites which allow the hacker to locate information passively. By using these footprinting tools, a hacker can gain some basic information on or footprint the target. By fast footprinting the target, a hacker can eliminate tools that will not work against the target systems or network. For example, if a graphics design firm uses all 
machine touch computers then all hacking software that targets windows systems can be eliminated footprinting not only speeds up the hacking process by eliminating certain tool sets but also minimize the chance of detection as fewer hacker hacking attempts can be made by using the right tool for the job for the exercise you will perform reconnaissance and information gathering on a target company i recommend you use your own organization but because these tools are passive any organization name can be used information gathering methodology some of the common tools used for footprinting and information gathering are as follows domain name lockup who is ns look up sam spad before we discuss these tools keep in mind that open source information can also yield a wealth of information about our target such as phone numbers and addresses performing whose requests searching domain name systems tables and using other lookup web tools are forms of open source footprinting most of this information is fairly easy to get and legal to obtain footprinting a target footprinting is part of the preparatory pre attack phase and involves accumulating data regarding a target's environment and architecture usually for the purpose of finding ways to intrude into that environment footprinting can reveal system vulnerabilities and identify the edge with which they can be exploited this is the easiest way for hackers to gather information about computer systems and the companies they belong to the purpose of this preparatory phase is to learn as much as you can about a system its remote access uh, capabilities its ports and services and any specific as aspects of its security using google to gather information a hacker may also do a google search or a yahoo people search to locate information about employees or the organization itself the google search engine can be used in creative ways to perform information gathering the use of the google search engine to retrieve information has been termed google hacking understanding dns enumeration DNS enumeration is the process of locating all the DNS servers and their corresponding records for an organization. A company may have both internet and external DNS servers that can yield information such as usernames, computer names, and IP address of potential target systems. NS Lookup and DNS Staff, the American Registry for Internet Numbers, and who is can will be used to gain information that can then be used to perform dns enumeration ns lookup and dns stuff one powerful tool you should be familiar with is ns lookup this tool requires dns servers for record information it's included in unix linux and windows operating systems hacking tools such as sam sped also include ns lookup tools Building on the information gathered from WHOIS, you can use NS Lookup to find additional IP addresses for servers and other hosts. Using the authoritative name server information from WHOIS, you can discover the IP address of the mail server. The explosion of easy to use tools has made hacking easy. If you know which tools to use, DNS stuff is another of those tools. Instead of using the command line NS lookup tool with its cumbersome switches to gather DNS record information, just access the website www.dnsstuff.com and you can do a DNS record search online. This search reveals all the allies records for www.econceal.org and the IP address of the web server. You can even discover all the names, servers, and associated IP addresses. Understanding who is an Erin lookup, who is evolved from the Unix operating system, but it can now be found in many operating systems as well as in hacking toolkits and on the internet 
this tool identifies who has registered domain names used for email or websites uh, uniform resources locator such as www.microsoft.com contains the domain name microsoft.com and a host name or allies www the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers requires registration of domain names to ensure that only a single company uses a specific domain name the whois tool requires the registration database to retrieve contact information about the individual or organization that holds a domain registration finding the address range of the network every ethical hacker needs to understand how to find the network range and subnet masks of the target systems ip addresses are used to locate scan and connect uh, to target systems you can find ip address in internet registries such as erin or the internet assigned numbers authority an ethical hacker may also need to find the geographical location of the target system or network this task can be accomplished by tracing the route a message task as it's sent to the destination ip addresses you can use tools like tracy route visual route and neo trace to identify the route to the target additionally as you trace your target network other useful information becomes available for example you can obtain internal ip addresses of host machines even the internet ip gateway of the organization may be uh, listed these addresses can then be used later in an attack or further scanning processes identifying types of dns records the following list database the contain dns records types and their uses address maps a host name to an ip address soa start of authority identifies the dns server responsible for the domain information cnaME uh, canonical name provides additional names or aliases for the address record mx mail exchange identifies the mail server for the domain srv service identifies services such as di directory services ptr pointer maps ip addresses to host names ns name server identifies other name servers for the domain using traceroute in foot footprinting Trace route is a packet tracking tool that is available for most operating systems. It operates by sending an internet control message protocol echo to each HOP route or gateway along the path until the destination address is reached. When ICMP messages are sent back from the router, the time to leave is decremented by 1 or 4 each router along the path this allows a hacker to determine how many hopes a router is from the sender hello everyone welcome to my lecture bypassing antivirus applications your pin testing clients will most likely be running some sort of antivirus solution so far in this lecture we have avoided having any of our malicious executables deleted by antivirus applications but antivirus program avoidance is a constantly changing field typically you will be more likely to avoid detection by using a memory corruption exploit and loading your payloads directly into memory that is by never touching the disk that said with the attack landscape shifting to emphasize client side and social engineering attacks it may not always be possible to avoid writing your payloads to disk in this lecture we will look at a few techniques for obscuring our malware to try to avoid detection when the payload is written to the disk trojans in in before lecture we created a stand alone malicious executable that runs a metasploit payload though we may be able to use social engineering to trick a user into downloading and running our malicious file the lack of 
any functionality other than our executable payload could tip off users that something is amiss we would be much more likely to evade detection if we could hide our payloads inside of some legitimate program that would run normally with our payload running in the background such a program is called a trojan after the legendary wooden horse that ended the trojan war the horse appeared to be an uh, innocuous offering to the gods and was brought inside the previously impenetrable world city of troy with enemy soldiers hiding inside ready to attack we encountered a trojan the bsftpd server on our you uh, boon to target had a backdoor that could be triggered at login by entering a smiley face as part of the username attacks compromised the source code repositories for bsftpd and added additional trojan functionality to the program anyone who downloaded vsf tpd from the official repositories between the initial compromise and detection ended up how antivirus applications work before we try different techniques to get our metasploit payloads passed on antivirus program let's discuss how this program work most antivirus solution start by comparing potentially dangerous code to to a set of patterns and rules that make up the antivirus definitions which match non malicious code antivirus definitions are updated regularly as new malware is identified it by each vendor this sort of uh, identification is called static analysis in addition to static analysis against a set of signatures most more advanced antivirus solution also test for malicious activity called dynamic analysis for example a program that tries to replace every file on the hard drive or con connects to a known botnet command and control server every 30 seconds is exhibiting potentially malicious activity and may be flagged Microsoft security essentials as we use different method in this section to bring down our detection rate keep in mind that even if you not able to get a 0% detection rate among all antivirus vendors if you know which antivirus solution is deployed in your clients environment you can focus your effort on clearing just that antivirus program in this lecture, we will try to bypass Microsoft Security Essential using various methods. When we created our Windows 7 target, before we installed Microsoft Security Essentials, but we didn't turn on real-time protection to scan files as they are downloaded or installed. Now let's turn on this protection to see if we can create an undetectable Trojan. Open Microsoft Security Essential, select the setting tab, choose real time protection and check the box to turn on this service. As of this writing, even free antivirus solution like Microsoft Security Essentials do a good job of catching metasploit payloads. For a real test, try installing the Trojan Redmin.exe with real time protection turned on. You should see a pop-up at the bottom right corner of the screen, like the one uh, shown below. The file is automatically deleted before the user can getting past an antivirus program. Clearly, if we want to get past antivirus solution, we need to try harder to hide. Let's look at some other useful ways to hide our metasploit payloads besides simply placing them inside of an executable encoding encoders are tools that allow you to avoid characters in an exploit that would bra break it you will learn more about these requirements when we write our own exploits later at 
the time of this writing metasploit support 32 encoders encoders mangle the payloads and prepend decoding instructions to be executed in order to decode the payload before it is run it is a common misperception that metasploits encoders were designed to help bypass antivirus programs some metasploit encoders create polymorphic code or mutating code which ensures that the encoded payload looks different each time the payload is generated this process makes it more difficult for antivirus vendors to create signatures for the payload but as we will see it is not enough to bypass most antivirus solution and the only encoder with an excellent rank is x86 slash sikata ganai sikata ganai is japanese for it can't be helped encoder ranking are based on the entropy level of the output with sikata ganai even the decoder stub is polymorphic the nitty gritty details of how this encoder works are beyond the scope of this lecture but suffice it to say that it mangles payloads beyond easy recognition tell msf ve nom to use the sikata gana encoder with the e flag as shown in listing 12 to 3 additionally for further obfuscation we will run our payload through the encoder multiple times encoding the output from the previous round with the i flag and specifying the number of encoding rounds now upload the resulting binary to virus total as you can see in flag uh, 12 to 6 35 of the tested antivirus products detected our payload even with the encoding there's a higher detection rate than we found when embedding our payload inside a pre-built executable in other or sikata gana alone doesn't do the hello everyone welcome to my lecture more of gaining access client side attack part 2 custom cross compiling as the de facto standard for penetration testing metasploit gets a fair amount of attention from antivirus vendors who make detecting the signatures for payloads generated by msf venom a priority when msf venom creates an executable it uses pre-built templates that antivirus vendors can use to build detection signature perhaps uh, we can improve our ability to bypass antivirus solutions by compiling an executable ourselves using raw cell code we need to fill in data for the variables random and cell code which are both unsigned character arrays. Our hope is that adding some randomness and compiling our own C code will be enough to trick antivirus programs. The random variable will introduce some randomness to the template. The cell code variable will hold the raw hexadecimal bytes of the payloads we create with MSF Venom. The main function runs when our compiled C program starts and execute our cell codes. Create your payloads in MSF Venom as usual, except this time offset for the mat with the A flag to C. Finally, we need to add some randomness. A good place to find randomness on a Linux system is in the uh, DAF slash U random file. This file is specifically designed as a a pseudo random number generator it generates data using entropy in the linux system we still need to work a little harder to get a malicious executable onto our windows 7 system we could have better success with this technique with another cross compiler from another repository encrypting executables with hyperion Another way to obfuscate our payloads is to encrypt it. One executable encryptor is Hyperion, which uses advanced execution standard. 
encryption a current industry standard after encrypting the executable hyperion throws away the encryption keys when the executable runs it brute forces the encryption key to decrypt itself back to the original executable if you have any background in, in uh, cryptography this process should raise a lot of red flags aes is currently considered a secure encryption standard if the executable doesn't have access to the encryption key, it should not be able to brute force the key in any reasonable amount of time, certainly not fast enough for our program to run in the time windows of our pin test. What's going on? As it turns out, Hyperion greatly reduces the possible key space for the encryption key, which means that binaries encrypted with it shouldn't be considered uh, cryptographically secure. However, because our goal and the goal of the Hyperion uh, authors is to uh, obf uh, obfuscate the code to bypass antivirus detection, the fact that the key can be brute forced is not a problem. Let's start by using Hyperion to encrypt a simple meterpreter executable with no additional antivirus avoidance techniques. Hyperion was written to run on Windows uh, systems, but we can run it on Kali Linux with the Win program. Be sure to change into the Hyperion directory created when you unzipped the source before running Hyperion.exe with Win. Hyperion takes two arguments, the name of the file to encrypt and the name of the encrypted outfit file run Hyperion to encrypt the simple meterpreter executable. The resulting file is in the Hyperion 1.0 directory, so upload it to VirusTotal from there. Using just a meterpreter executable generated with EMS Venom and encrypt it with Hyperion resulted in 27 antivirus programs in VirusTotal detecting the malicious behavior. That's not our lowest detection rate yet, but we have finally achieved our goal as Microsoft security agencies did not detect any malicious activity. Evading antivirus with veil evasion. Even though we have successfully reached our goal of bypassing Microsoft security agencies on Windows 7, the antivirus landscape changes rapidly, so it is worthwhile to keep abreast of the latest tools and techniques. Veil Evasion is a Python framework that automates create antivirus evading payloads, giving users the choice of multiple techniques. We covered installing Veil Evasion on Kali Linux, Python shell code injection with Windows APIs. Previously, we looked at using a custom C template to compile and execute shell code. We can do something similar with Python's uh, type C types library, which gives us access to Windows API function calls and can create C compatible data types. We can use uh, C types to access the Windows API virtual alloc, which creates a new executable memory region for the shell code and locks the memory region in physical memory. To avoid a page fault as shell code is copied in and executed RTL move memory is used to copy the shell code bytes into the memory region created by virtual alloc. The create thread API creates a new thread to run the shell codes and finally wait for single object waits until the created thread is finished and our shell code has finished running. These steps collectively are referred to as the virtual alloc injection method. This method, of course, would give us a Python script rather than a Windows executable, but you can use multiple tools to convert a Python script into a standard alone executable. Creating encrypted Python generated executables with veil evasion. One of the methods implemented in veil evasion uses, uses the Python injection technique described earlier. To provide further antivirus protection, Valuation can use encryption. 
for our example we will use python vert l alloc injection combined with aes encryption as we did in the hyper example earlier as of this writing there are 28 ways to create executables implemented in valuation for this example choose option 23 to use the virtual alloc injection method and encrypt it with AES encryption. Once you choose a method, validation will prompt you to change the method options from the default if desired. Validation prompts you to select either MSF Venom to generate the shell code or to provide custom shell code. For our purposes, choose MSF Venom. The default payload is Windows slash Metapreter slash Reverse TCP. So press Enter to select it. You should be prompt for the usual options l host and l port and for a file name for the generated executable finally veil evasion offers two python to executable methods choose the default uh, p py installer to have veil evasion generate the malicious executable and save it to the uh, veil output slash compiled directory as of this writing, the resulting executable sales right past Microsoft Security Agent sales on our Windows 7 box. Well, evasion note that you shouldn't upload the resulting executable to online scanners. So, at the author's request, we will forego checking this example with virus total. However, we can install other antivirus solution besides Microsoft Security Agent CL. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture, PDF exploits, portable document format, software can also be exploited, if a user can be enticed to open a malicious PDF in a vulnerable viewer, the program can be exploited, the most popular PDF viewer for Windows system is Adobe Reader, like browser, Adobe Reader has a history littered with security holes, also like browsers. Even when a past management process is in place, regularly updating the underlying operating system, PDF software is uh, often forgotten and remains at an older vulnerable version, exploiting a PDF vulnerability. Our Windows target has an outdated version of Adobe Reader 8.1.2 installed that is subject to CVE 2008. 2992 uh, attack based buffer overflow the corresponding metasploit module is exploit slash windows slash file format slash adobe util print f the option for this module are a bit different than anything we have seen thus far this is a client side attack so there is no r host options but unlike our browser attack there are also no uh, srv host or SRV port options. This module simply creates a malicious PDF. Hosting it for delivery and setting up a payload handler is up to us. Of course, we have all the skills necessary to perform both these takes easily. A Metasploit PDF exploit. As you can see, the only option for the PDF exploit is the name of the malicious file to be generated. We can leave the default msf.pdf. For this com example, we will have Metasploit use the default payload Windows slash Metapreter slash Reverse TCP on port 4444. When we enter exploit, Metasploit generates a PDF that will exploit this vulnerability in vulnerable versions of Adobe Reader on Windows XP, SP3, English. The malicious PDF is stored as root slash in msf4 slash local slash msf dot pdf serving the malicious pdf and using a handler we copy the file to the apache web server folder and start the server if it is not already running we will look at ways to lure users into opening malicious files later in this lecture but for now, we will just open the malicious PDF in Adobe Reader 8.1.2 on our Windows XP target. First, 
so we need to set up a handler for the payload we can use the multi slash handler module as we learned before be sure to kill the aurora job if its handler is also listening on port 4444 to free up this port for multi slash handler use when we open the malicious pdf we again receive a session typically with an attack like this we won't be targeting just one user for best results we might use this malicious pdf as part of a social engineering campaign as discussed in the next by sending out a few to even hundreds of malicious pdfs in an attempt to entice users to open them the multi slash handler listener we set up previously will close as soon as it sees the first connection causing us to miss any other connections that come in from other users opening the pdf it would be much better if we could leave our listener open to catch additional incoming connections as it turns out an advanced option for the multi slash handler module solves this problem the advanced option exit one session which is set to true by default specifies whether the listener close after it receive a session if we set this option to false the listener will stay open and allow us to catch multiple session with a single handler pdf embedded executable now for another pdf attack this time we will embedded a malicious executable inside a pdf the corresponding metasploit module is exploit slash windows slash file format slash adobe pdf embedded exe instead of exploiting the software as soon as the pdf is opened the generated pdf will prompt the user for permission to run the embedded file the success of our attack is contingent on the user allowing our executable to run pdf embedded exe module the module lets us specify a pre-built executable file with the x name option if we don't set this option we can embed an .exe file created from whatever payload we select we can again change the file name to anything we like or leave the value as the default to use this module we must use an input pdf for the uh, infilmene option the launch message option is the text that will be shown to the user as part of the prompt to run the executable setting module options and creating the malicious pdf we will use a PDF included with Kali Linux for our example. The Metasploit user guide at user slash share slash set slash readme slash user manual dot PDF. The generated PDF is again stored in the root slash msf4 slash local slash directory. Be sure to set up a handler for the payload with the multi handler model before opening the PDF on the Windows XP target. Remember. The previous exploit may have left Adobe Reader in a bad state as you may need to restart Windows XP to get it to properly load the new PDF. Java exploits Java vulnerability Java vulnerabilities are a prevalent client side attack vector. In fact, some experts suggested that in light of the security issues that plug Java users should uninstall or disable the software in their browser one thing that makes java attack so powerful is that one exploit can gain access to multiple platforms windows mac and even linux systems running the java runtime environment in a browser can call be exploited by exactly the same exploit when the browser opens a malicious page here are some sample exploits java vulnerability as exhibit number one we will use the metasploit module exploit slash multi slash browser java jre 17 jmx bin use of this module is similar to that of the internet explorer aurora exploit shown earlier in this lecture 
Metasploit sets up a malicious server to exploit this cross-platform vulnerability on any browser that arrives at the page. Setting up a Java exploit. Set up the options to match your environment. Set the uh, SRV host options to the local IP addresses and change the SRV port if you would like. Set the URI path to something that will be easy to type in your target browser. Notice that because this exploit is multi-platform and the code execution takes place entirely inside the JRE, our payload options are Java based. The usual suspects are all here from staged payloads, inline payloads, bind cells, reverse cells, meter peter and so on. We will use the payload java slash meter preter slash reverse http which uses legitimate http traffic. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. Exploitation. After all that preparatory work, we finally get to the funny stuff exploitation. In the exploitation phase of the pin test, we run exploit against the vulnerabilities we have discovered to gain access to target systems. Some vulnerabilities such as the use of default passwords are so easy to exploit, it hardly feels like exploitation at all. Others are much more complicated. In this lecture, we will look at exploiting the vulnerabilities we identified in previous lecture to gain a foothold in target machines. We will return to our friend MS08067 from previous lecture. Now that we have more background about the vulnerability, we will also exploit an issue in the SL mail POP3 server with a Metasploit module. In addition, we will uh, piggyback on a previous compromise and bypass login on the FTP server on our Linux target. We will exploit a vulnerability in the TikiWiki install on the Linux target and a couple of default password issues on an uh, XAMPP installed on the Windows target. We will also take advantage of a readable and writable NFS share to take control of the SSH keys and login as a valid user without knowing the password. We will interact with a fragile uh, web server on a non-standard port to take advantage of a directory traverse cell issue and download system files for a refresher on how we discovered each of the issues we will use for exploitation we know that the SMB server on our Windows XP target is missing the MS08067 patch. The MS08067 vulnerability has a good reputation for successful exploits and the corresponding Metasploit model is ranked as great. We used this vulnerability as an example but the knowledge we gained in the previous lecture give us solid evidence that this exploit will result in a compromise. When you read the options for the Windows SMB MS08067 and NetAP module before we saw the usual uh, R host and R port as well as SMB pipe which allows us to set the pipe that our exploit will use. The default is the browser pipe, though we can also use SRV SRC. We run the Metasploit module scanner slash SMB slash pipe auditor to enumerate this listening SMB pipes and found that only the browser pipe is available. Thus we know that the default SMB pipe option browser is the only one that will work. Staged payloads the windows slash sales slash reverse tcp payload it is staged if you use it with the windows slash smb slash ms08067 netapi exploit the string sent to the smb server to take control of the target machine does not contain all of the instruction to create the reverse cell instead it contains a stager payload with such 
with just enough information to connect back to the attack machine and ask Metasploit for instruction on what to do next. When we launch the exploit, Metasploit sets up a handler for the windows slash shell slash reverse tcp payload to catch the incoming reverse connection and serve up the rest of the payload in this case a reverse shell then the completed payload is executed and metasploit's handler catches the reverse shell the amount of memory space available for a payload may be limited and some advanced metasploit payloads can take up a lot of space Stage payloads allow us to use complex payloads without requiring a lot of space in memory. Inline payloads The Windows slash shell reverse TCP payload is an inline or single payload. Its exploit string contains all the code necessary to push a reverse shell back to the attacker machine. Though inline payloads take up more space than stage payloads, they are more stable and consistent because all the instructions are included in the original exploit string. You can distinguish inline and stage payloads by the syntax of their module name. Metarpreter Metarpreter is a custom payload written for the Metasploit project. It is loaded directly into the memory of an exploited process using a technique known as reflective DLL injection. As mass meter Peter resides entirely in memory and writes nothing to the disk, it runs inside the memory of the host process, so it doesn't need to start a new process that might be noticed by an intrusion prevention or intrusion detection system. Exploiting OpenPHP MyAdmin, the same target XAMPP platform exploited in the previous section also includes an open PHP MyAdmin install, which we can explore to run commands on the database server like Apache. Our MySQL server will uh, have either system privileges or the privileges of the user that started the MySQL. SQL process. By accessing the MySQL database, we can perform an attack similar to our web dev attack and upload scripts to, to the web server using MySQL requires. To explore this attack, first navigate uh, to http slash slash 192.168.20.1 and click the SQL tab at the top. We will use MySQL to write a script to the web server that we will use to get a remote cell. We will use a SQL select statement to the output a PHP script to a file on the web server which will allow us to remotely control the target system. We will use the script to grab the CMD parameter from the URL and execute it using the system command. Run the completed query in PHP MyAdmin and then browse to the newly created file http slash slash 192.168.20.10 slash shell.php. The script should throw the error warning system. Control execute a blank command in drive because we did not supply an CMD parameter. We need to supply a CMD parameter that tells the script the command we would like to run on the target system. For example, we can ask the Windows XP target to tell us its networking information using IPCONFIZ as the CMD parameter. Downloading a file with TFTP. The previous steps give us a shell with the system privileges which will which we upgrade by uploading a more complicated PHP script. But rather than creating a really long and complicated SQL select query, we can host a file on our Kali machine and then use our PHP shell to pull it down to the web server. On Linux we could use uh, wget to uh, download files from the command line. This functionality is painfully absent on Windows, but we can use TFT on Windows. Hello everyone.
welcome to my lecture exploiting web dev default credentials we found that the XAMPP installation on our Windows XP target employees default login credentials for the web dev folder used to upload files to the web server this issue allows us to upload our own pages to the server with cadaver a command line client for web dev which we use to verify this vulnerability let's create a simple test file to upload now use cadaver with the credentials wampp xampp to authenticate with web dev finally use web dev devs put command to upload our test dot text file to the web server if you browse to webdev slash test dot text you should see that we have successfully uploaded our text file to the website running a script on the target web server a text file is not very useful to us it would be better if we could upload a script and execute it on the web server allowing us to run commands on the underlining systems apache web server if apache is installed as a system service it will have system level privileges which we could use to gain maximum control over our target if not apache will run with privileges of the user who started it either way you should end up with a good diff of good deal of consumer who started it either way you should end up with a good deal of consumer who started it i either way you should end up with a good deal of control over the underlining system just by dropping a file on the web server let's start by confirming that our web dev users is allowed to upload scripts to the server because we found php my admin software on this web server we know that the xampp software includes php if we upload and execute a php file we should be able to run commands on the system using php uploading a msf venom payload in addition to uploading any php scripts we have created to perform tasks on the target we can also use msf venom to generate a stand alone metasploit payload to upload to the server we used msf venom briefly previously but to brush up on syntax you can enter msf venom h for help when you are ready list all the available payloads with the number one option for php payloads metasploit php payloads msf venom gives us a few options we can download and execute a file on the system create a cell or even use metapreter any of these payloads will give us control of the system but let's start php slash metapreter slash reverse tcp after we specify a payload we can use zero to find out which options we need to use with it we need to set l host to tell the payload which ip address to connect back to and we can also change the l port option because this payload is already in php format we can output it in the raw format with the f option after we set our options and then pipe the raw php code into a file with the dot php extension for posting to the server downloading a file with tft the previous steps gives as a cell with system privileges which we upgrade by uploading a more complicated php script but rather than creating a really long and complicated sql select query we can host a file on our kali machine and then use our php cell to put it down to the web server on linux we could use wget to download files from the command line this functionality is painfully absent on windows but we can use tft on windows xp let's use it 
to upload meterpeter.php from the previous section. TFTP is not the only way we can transfer file with non-interactive command line access. In fact, some newer Windows systems do not have TFTP enabled by default. You can also have TFT read setting from a file with the S option or use a scripting language such as Visual Basic or PowerShell on the latest Windows operating systems. We can use the ATFTPD TFTP server to host files on our Kali system. Start ATFTPD in diamond mode. Serving files from the location of your meterpreter.php script. Transferring files with TFTP. Now we can browse to http dot slash slash one nine two dot one six eight dot two zero dot one zero slash meterpreter dot php to open a meterpreter cell. Be sure to restart the handler to catch the meterpreter connection before executing the script. And as you can see, so we used an attack different from uploading a file through web dev. We ended up in the same place. We have a meter preter shell from the web server using its access to the MySQL server to upload files. This is not the only way we could exploit database access. For example, if you find a Microsoft MS SQL database instead, you may be able to use the XPCMD shell. 11 function which acts as a built-in system command cell for security reasons it is disabled uh, on newer versions of ms sql but a user with administrative privileges should be able to re-enable it giving use cell access without having to upload anything downloading sensitive files our jarvit server on port 3232 has a directory traversal issue that will allow us to download files from the remote system without authentication. We can download the windows boot.ini configuration file and other files too through the browser with the following URL. We will use this ability to pull files containing password hatches, encrypted password for windows as well as installed services. Downloading a configuration file. The default install location for XAMPP is C slash XAMPP. So we can expect the directory for FileZilla FTP server to be at C dot slash XAMPP slash FileZilla FTP. A little online research on FileZilla tell us that it stores md5 hatches of passwords in the filezilla server.xml configuration file depending on the strength of the ftp passwords stored in this file we may be able to use the md5 hatch values to recover users plain text ftp passwords we captured the password for user gorging but our target may contain additional accounts let use the Zarvit server to download the Zilla file configuration. Hello everyone, welcome to my lecture. Exploiting web dev default credentials. We found that the XAMPP installation on our Windows XP target employs default login credentials for the web dev folder used to upload files to the web server. This issue allows us to upload our own pages to the server with Cadaver, a command line client for web dev, which we use to verify this vulnerability. Let's create a simple test file to upload. Now use Cadaver with the credentials WAMPP XAMPP to authenticate with web dev. Finally, use web dev, devs put command to upload our test.txt file to the web server. If you browse to web dev slash test.txt, you should see that we have successfully uploaded our text file to the website. 
running a script on the target web server. A text file is not very useful to us. It would be better if we could upload a script and execute it on the web server, allowing us to run commands on the underlying systems Apache web server. If Apache is installed as a system service, it will have system level privileges, which we could use to gain maximum control over our target. If not, Apache will run with privileges of the user who started it. Either way, you should end up with a good deal of good deal of consumer who started it. Either way, you should end up with a good deal of consumer who started it. I. Either way, you should end up with a good deal of control over the underlying system just by dropping a file on the web server. Let's start by confirming that our web dev users is allowed to upload scripts to the server because we found PHP my admin software on this web server. We know that the XAMPP software includes PHP. If we upload and execute a PHP file, we should be able to run commands on the system using PHP. Uploading a MSF Venom payload. In addition to uploading any PHP scripts, we have created to perform tasks on the target. We can also use MSF Venom to generate a standalone Metasploit payload to upload to the server. We used MSF Venom briefly previously, but to brush up on syntax, you can enter MSF Venom H for help when you are ready. List all the available payloads with the number one option for PHP payloads. Metasploit PHP payloads. MSF Venom gives us a few options. We can download and execute a file on the system, create a cell, or even use Metapreter. Any of these payloads will give us control of the system. But let's start PHP slash Metapreter slash reverse TCP. After we specify a payload, we can use zero to find out which options we need to use with it we need to set l host to tell the payload which ip address to connect back to and we can also change the l port option because this payload is already in php format we can output it in the raw format with the f option after we set our options and then pipe the raw php code into a file with the dot php extension for posting to the server downloading a file with tft the previous steps gives us a cell with system privileges which we upgrade by uploading a more complicated php script but rather than creating a really long and complicated sql select query we can host a file on our Kali machine and then use our PHP cell to put it down to the web server. On Linux, we could use wget to download files from the command line. This functionality is being fully absent on Windows, but we can use pft p on Windows XP. Let's use it to upload meterpreter.php from the previous section. TFTP is not the only way we can transfer file with non-interactive command line access. In fact, some newer Windows systems do not have TFTP enabled by default. You can also have TFT read setting from a file with the S option or use a scripting language such as Visual Basic or PowerShell on the latest Windows operating systems. We can use the ATFTPD TFTP server to host files on our Kali system. Start ATFTPD in diamond mode, serving files from the location of your meterpreter.php script. Transferring files with TFTP. Now we can browse to http dot slash slash one nine two dot one six eight dot two zero dot one zero slash meter printer dot php to open a meter printer cell be sure to restart the handler to catch the meter printer connection before executing the script and as you can see 
so we used an attack different from uploading a file so web dev we ended up in the same place we have a meter printer shell from the web server using its access to the my sql server to upload files this is not the only way we could exploit database access for example if we find a microsoft ms sql database instead you may be able to use the xpcmd cell 11 function which acts as a built-in system command cell for security reasons it is disabled uh, on newer versions of ms sql but a user with administrative privileges should be able to re-enable it giving you cell access without having to upload anything downloading sensitive files our jarvit server on port 3232 has a directory traversal issue that will allow us to download files from the remote system without authentication we can download the windows boot dot ini configuration file and other files too through the browser with the following url we will use this ability to pull files containing password hatches encrypted password for windows as well as installed services downloading a configuration file the default install location for xampp is uh, c slash xampp so we can expect the directory for filezilla ftp server to be at c dot slash xampp slash filezilla ftp a little online research on filezilla tell us that it stores md5 hatches of passwords in the filezilla server.xml configuration file depending on the strength of the ftp passwords stored in this file we may be able to use the md5 hatch values to recover users plain text ftp passwords we captured the password for user gorging but our target may contain additional accounts let's use the zarvit server to download the zilla file configuration hello everyone welcome to my lecture exploitation after all that preparatory work we finally get to the funny stuff exploitation in the exploitation phase of the pin test we run exploit against the vulnerabilities we have discovered to gain access to target systems some vulnerabilities such as the use of default passwords are so easy to exploit it hardly feels like exploitation at all others are much more complicated in this lecture we will look at exploiting the vulnerabilities we identified in previous lecture to gain a foothold in target machines we will return to our friend ms08067 from previous lecture now that we have more background about the vulnerability we will also exploit an issue in the sl mail pop3 server with a metasploit module in addition we will uh, piggyback on a previous compromise and bypass login on the ftp server on our linux target we will exploit a vulnerability in the tiki wiki install on the linux target and a couple of default password issues one and uh, xampp installed on the windows target we will also take advantage of a readable and writable nfscr to take control of the ssh keys and login as a valid user without knowing the password we will interact with a fragile uh, web server one a non-standard port to take advanced stage of a directory traverse cell issue and download system files for a refresher on how we discovered each of the issues we will use for exploitation we know that the smp server on our windows xp target is missing the ms08067 patch the ms08067 vulnerability has a good reputation for successful exploits and the corresponding metasploit model is ranked as great 
we use this vulnerability as an example but the knowledge we gained in the previous lecture give us solid evidence that this exploit will result in a compromise when you hit the options for the windows smb ms08067 and netap module before we saw the usual uh, r host and r port as well as smb pipe which allows us to set the pipe that our exploit will use the default is the browser pipe so we can also use srvsrc we run the metasploit module scanner slash smb slash pipe auditor to enumerate this listening smb pipes and found that only the browser pipe is available thus we know that the default smb pipe option browser is the only one that will work staged payloads the windows slash shell slash reverse tcp payload is staged if you use it with the windows slash smb slash ms08067 netapi exploit the string sent to the smb server to take control of the target machine does not contain all of the instruction to create the reverse shell instead it contains a stager payload with such with just enough information to connect back to the attack machine and ask metasploit for instruction on what to do next when we launch the exploit metasploit sets up a handler for the windows slash shell slash reverse tcp payload to catch the incoming reverse connection and serve up the rest of the payload in this case a reverse shell then the completed payload is executed and metasploit's handler catches the reverse shell the amount of memory space available for a payload may be limited and some advanced metasploit payloads can take up a lot of space stage payloads allow us to use complex payloads without requiring a lot of space in memory inline payloads the windows slash shell reverse tcp payload is an inline or single payload its exploit string contains all the code necessary to push a reverse shell back to the attacker machine though inline payloads take up more space than stage payloads they are more stable and consistent because all the instructions are included in the original exploit string you can distinguish inline and stage payloads by the syntax of their module name metarpreter metarpreter is a custom payload written for the metasploit project it is loaded directly into the memory of an exploited process using a technique known as reflective dll injection as much metarpreter resides entirely in memory and writes nothing to the disk it runs inside the memory of the host process so it doesn't need to start a new process that might be noticed by an intrusion prevention or intrusion detection system exploiting open php my admin the same target xampp platform exploited in the previous section also includes an open php my admin install which we can explore to run commands on the database server like apache our mysql server will uh, have either system privileges or the privileges of the user that started the mysql process by accessing the mysql database we can perform an attack similar to our web dev attack and upload scripts to, to the web server using mysql requires to explore this attack first navigate uh, to http slash slash 192.168.20.10 slash php my admin and click the sql tab at the top we will use my sql to write a script to the web server that we will use to get a remote cell we will use a sql select statement to the output a php script to a file on the web server which will allow us to remotely control the target system we will use the script to grab the cmd parameter from the url and execute it using the system command 
run the completed query in php my admin and then browse to the newly created file http slash slash one nine two dot one six eight dot two zero dot one zero slash cell dot php the script should throw the error warning system control execute a blank command in c drive because we did not supply an cmd parameter we need to supply a cmd parameter that tells the script the command we would like to run on the target system for example we can ask the windows xp target to tell us its networking information using ipconfiz as the cmd parameter downloading a file with tftp the previous steps give us a shell with the system privileges which will which we upgrade by uploading a more complicated php script but rather than creating a really long and complicated sql select query we can host a file on our kali machine and then use our php shell to pull it down to the web server on linux we could use uh, wget to uh, download files from the command line this functionality is painfully absent on windows but we can use dft on windows hello everyone welcome to my lecture downloading the windows sam speaking of passwords in addition to the ftp user passwords we can try pulling down the windows security accounts manager slash sam file that stores windows hatches the sam file is obfuscated because the windows sys key utility encrypts the password hatches inside the sam file with 128-bit revised to provide additional security even if any attacker or pin test star is able to gain access to the sam file there is a bit more work to do to recover the password hatches we need a key to reverse the rc4 encryption on the hatches the encryption key for the syskey utility called the boot key is stored inside of the windows system file we need to download both the sam and system files to recover the hatches and attempt to reverse them into plain text passwords in windows xp these files are located at c slash windows slash system 32 slash config so let's try downloading the sam file when we try to use jarvi to download this file we get a file not found error it looks like it, our Zarvit server doesn't have access to this file. Luckily, Windows XP backs up both the SAM and system files to the C slash Windows slash repair directory. And if we try to pull down the files from there, Zarvit is able to serve them. Note, like our MD5 hatches, we will use the Windows SAM files in the next lecture when we cover password attacks in depth exploiting a buffer overflow in third-party software we never did find for sure if the sl mail server one hour windows xp target is vulnerable to the pop3 issue cve 2003 0264 the version number reported by sl mail 5.5 appears to line up with the vulnerability so let's try exploiting it the corresponding metasploit module windows slash pop3 slash settle lab pass has a rank of great a ranking that is high unlikely to crash the service of it fails windows slash pop3 slash settle lab pass attempts to exploit a buffer overflow in the pop3 server using it similar to setting up the ms08067 exploit exploiting sl mail 5.5 pop3 with metasploit running this exploit should give us another meter preter session on the windows xp target yet another way to take control of the system exploiting third party web applications we used the nikto web scanner against our linux target and discovered an installer of the 
sticky wiki GMS software version 1.9.8 with a code execution vulnerability in the script graph formula.php a search for tiki wiki in metasploit returns several models based on the model names unix slash web app slash tiki wiki graph formula x c looks like the one we need because it has graph formula in its name our assumption is confirmed when we run info on the module the ysvdb number listed in the references for unix slash web app slash tiki wiki slash graph formula x matches our nick to output the options for this module are different from our previous exploit examples we could set a proxy chain and a virtual host for the tiki wiki server but we don't need to here we can leave the url set to the default location slash tiki wiki this exploit involves php command execution so naturally our payloads are php based using the show payloads command reveals that we can use php based meter printer as we did in our xampp exploit we will also need to set our lhost options again while exploiting the tiki wiki installer the meta exploit module discovered the credentials for the tiki wiki database Unfortunately, the MySQL server is not listening on the network, so these credentials cannot be used for additional compromise. Still, we should note them because they might come in handy during post-exploitation. Exploiting a compromised service The FTP server on the Linux target service a banner for very secure FTP 2.3.4. The version replaced with a binary containing a backdoor because the official code was eventually restored by the authors of VSFTPD. The only way to find out if the server on our Linux target has the backdoor code is to test it. We don't need to worry about potential crashing the service if it's not vulnerable. If this server doesn't have the backdoor code, we will just get a login error when we use the smiley face. Enter any username you like and add a at the end. Use anything for the password as well as if the backdoor is present, it will trigger without valid credential. We notice that the login hangs after the passwords. This tells us that the FTP server is still processing our login attempts and if we query the FTP port again, it will continue to respond. Let's use netcat to try connecting to port 6200 where the root cell down spawn if the backdoor is present. Sure enough, we have a root cell. Root privileges give us a total control of our target machine. For example, we can get the system password hatches with the command cat save the password hatches for the user Gorzia to a file called linux passwords.txt we will attempt to turn this hash into a plain text password exploiting open nfs shares at this point we know that the linux target has exported user Gorzia's home folder using nfs and that share is available to anyone without the need for credentials but this might not carry much security risk if we cannot use the access to read or write sensitive files recall that when we scanned the nfs mount we saw the dot sss directory this directory could contain the user's priv private sssh keys as well as keys used for authenticating a user over SSH. Let's see if we can exploit this share. Start by mounting the NFS share on your Kali system. This doesn't look too promising at first glance because Georgia has no documents, pictures or videos. Just some simple buffer overflow example we will use later. There doesn't appear to be any sensitive information here but before we jump to conclusion let's see what's in the dot ssh directory we know have access to georgia's ssh keys 
the IDRSA file is her private key and IDRSA.pub is her corresponding public key. We can read or even change these values and we can write to the SSH file authorized keys which handles a list of SSH public keys that are authorized to log in as the user Georgia and because we have write privileges we can add our own key there here that will allow us to bypass password authentication when logging into the Ubuntu target as Georgia hello everyone welcome to my lecture password attacks passwords are often the path of least resistance on pin testing engagements a client with a strong security program can fix missing windows patches and out of date software but the users themselves can't be patched we will look at attacking users when we discuss social engineering later but if we can correctly guess or calculate a user's password we may be able to avoid involving the user in the attack at all in this lecture we will look at how to use tools to automate running services on our target and sending usernames and passwords additionally we will study cracking the password hatches we gained access password management companies are working up to the inherent risk of password based authentication brute force attacks and educated guesses are both serious risks to weak password many organizations use biometric or two-factor authentication to mitigate this risk even web services such as gmail and dropbox offer two-factor authentication in which the user provides a password as well as a second value such as the digits on an electronic token if two-factor authentication is not available using strong password is in imperative imperative for account security because all that stands between the attacker and sensitive data may come down to a simple string strong passwords are long use characters from multiple complexity classes and are not based on a di dictionary word the passwords we use in this lecture are deliberately terrible but unfortunately many users don't behave much better when it comes to passwords organization can force users to create strong passwords but as passwords become more complex they become harder to remember users are likely to leave a password that they can't remember in a file on their computer in their smartphone or even on a post-it note because it's just easier to keep up track them that way of course password that can be discovered lying around in plain text undermine the security of using a strong password another cardinal <coughs> scene of good password management is using the same password on many sites in a worst case scenario the ceo's weak password for a compromised web forum might just be the very same one for his or her corporate access to financial documents password risk is something to bear in mind while performing password attacks you may find the same passwords work on multiple systems and sites password management presents a difficult problem for it staff and will likely continue to be a fruitful avenue for attackers unless or until password based authentication is phased out entirely in favor of another model online password attacks just as we used automated scans to find vulnerabilities we can use scripts to automatically attempt to log in to services and find valid credentials we will use tools designed for automating online password attacks or guessing passwords until the server response with a successful login these tools use a technique called brute forcing tools that use brute forcing try every possible username and password combination and given enough time they will find valid credentials the trouble with brute forcing is that as a stronger password are used the time it takes to brute force them moves from hours to years and even beyond your natural lifetime 
we can probably find working credentials more easily by feeding educated guesses about the correct passwords uh, into an automated login tool the dictionary words are easy to remember so despite the security warnings many users incorporate them into passwords slightly more security conscious users might put some numbers at the end of their password or maybe even an exclamation point word list before you can use a tool to guess passwords you need a list of credentials to try if you don't know the name of the user account you want to crack or you just want to crack as many account as possible you can provide a username list for the password guessing tool to iterate through user lists when creating a user list first try to determine the client's username scheme for instance if we are trying to break into employee email accounts figure out the pattern the email addresses follow are they first name dot last name just a first name or something else you can look for good username candidates on lists of common first or last name. Of course, the guesses will be even more likely to succeed if you can find the names of your target's actual employees. If a company uses a first initial followed by a last name for the username scheme and they have an employee named John Smith, John Smith is likely a valid username. Listing one to uh, 9 shows a very short sample user list. You would probably want a large list of users in an actual engagement. Guessing usernames and passwords with Hydra. If you have a set of credential that you don't, you would like to try against a running service that requires a login. You can input them manually one by one or use a tool to automate the process. Hydra is an online password guessing tool that can be used to test usernames and passwords for running services. Following the tradition of naming security tools after the victims or Heracles levers, Hydra is named for the mythical Greek serpent with many heads. Listing 9 to 5 shows how to use Hydra to guess usernames and passwords by running through our username and password files to uh, search for valid uh, POP3 credentials on our Windows XP target. This command uses the L flag to specify the username file, the P for the password list file and specifies the protocol POP3. Hydra finds that user Georgia's password is password at same on Georgia for using such an insecure password. Sometimes you will know that a specific username exists on a server and you just need a valid password to go with it. For example, we use the SMTP VRFY verb to find valid usernames on the SL mail server on the Windows XP target. As you can see in listing 9 to 6, we can use the one flag instead of L to specify the particular username specify the pop3 protocol and provide the username and password when prompt unfortunately there are no love letters in this particular inbox hydra can perform online password guessing against a range of services for example here we use the credentials we found with hydra to log in with netcat keep in mind that most services can be configured to lock out accounts after a certain uh, number of uh, failed login attempts. There are few better ways to get noticed by a client's IT staff than suddenly locking out serve several user accounts. Logins in rapid succession can also tip off firewalls and instruction prevention systems which will get your IP address blocked at the uh, perimeter. Slowing down and randomizing scans can help with this but there is of course a trade-off slower scans will take longer to produce results one way to avoid having your login attempts noticed is to try to guess a password before trying to log in as you will learn in the next section hello everyone welcome to my lecture installing kali linux kali is the successor to the backtrack linux distribution designed by offensive security from the group up as a penetration testing operating system. It comes with a number of tools pre-installed and is based on Debian Linux. 
so you will also be able to install a wide variety of additional tools and libraries beyond what's on the ways to start first grab a kali vm image from the following url http slash slash images dot offensive security dot com slash kali linux 1.0.9 vm i4867.7 z download and decompress the image and then double click to make it vm where player for fire it up the default username is root and the password is tour this should get you into all the full kali desktop environment the first thing we are going to do is ensure that the correct version of python is installed this lecture will use python 2.7 throughout in the shell execute the following root at kali into python double equal version python 2.7.3 root at kali if you downloaded the exact image that i've recommended python 2.7 will be automatically installed please note that using a different version of python might break some of the code examples you have been warned now let's add some useful pieces of python package management in the form of easy install and pipe these are much like the apt package manager because they allow you to directly install python libraries without having to manual download unpack and install them let's install both of these package managers by using the following commands root at kali hashtag apt get install python setup tools python pip when the package are installed we can do a quick test and install the module that we will use before to build a github based trojan enter the following into your terminal root at kali pipe install git ehub3.py you should see output in your terminal indicating that the library is being downloaded and installed then drop into a python shell and validate that it was installed correctly root at kali python python 2.7.3 bracket default march 20 2014 if your results are not identical to this then there is a misconfiguration in your python environment and you have brought great same to our python dojo in this case make sure that you followed all the steps above and that you have the correct version of kali keep in mind that for most examples throughout this lecture you can develop your code in a variety of environments including mac linux and windows there are some chapters that are windows specific and i'll make sure to let you know at the beginning of the lecture now that we have our hacking virtual machine set up let's install a python ide for development wing ide while i typically don't advocate commercial software products wing ide is the best ide that i have used in the past seven years at immunity wing ide provides all the basic ide functionality like auto completion and explanation of function parameters but its debugging capabilities are what set it apart from other ides i will give you a quick rundown of the commercial version of ide but of course you should choose whichever version is best for you you can grab wing ide from http slash slash www.wingware.com slash and i recommend that you install the trial so that you can experience firsthand some of the features available in the commercial version you can do your development on any platform you wish but it might be best to install wing ide on your kali vm at least to get started if you have followed along with my instructions so far 
make sure that you downloaded the 32bit.dep package for wing id and save it to your user directory then drop into a terminal and run the following root at kali dpkg i wing d 5 5.0.91 i386 deb this should install wing id as planned if you get any installation errors there might be unmet dependencies this should fix any missing dependencies and install wing IDE. To verify that you have installed it properly, make sure you can run access it. Fire up wing IDE and open a new blank python file. Then follow along as I give you a quick rundown some of usual useful features. For starters, your screen with your main code editing area in the top left and set of tabs on the bottom. Let's write some simple code to illustrate some of the useful functions of Wing IDE, including the debug prob and stake data tabs. Punch the following code into the editor dev sum bracket number one, comma number two, number one int is equal to convert integer bracket number one number 2 int is equal to convert integer bracket number 2 result equal to number 1 int plus number 2 int return result def convert integer bracket number string converted integer equal to int bracket number string return converted integer answer equal to sum bracket comma 1 comma 2 this is a very convict example but it is an excellent demonstration of how to make your life easy with wing ide save it with any file name you want click the debug menu item and select the select current as main debug file option setting the current python script for debugging click the debug menu item and select the select current as main debug file option so as shown below now set a break point on the line of code that says return converted integer you can do this by clicking in the left margin or by hitting the f9 key you should see a little red dot appear in the margin now run the script by pressing f5 and execution should halt at your breakpoint click the stake data tab and you should see a screen like this one the stake data tab is going to show us some useful information such as the state of any local and global variables at the moment that our breakpoint was hit this allows you to debug more advanced code where you need to inspect variables during execution to track down bugs if we click the drop down bar you can also see the current call stake which tells you which function called the function you are currently inside we can see that convert integer was called from the sum function on line 3 of our python script this becomes very useful if you have recursive function calls or a function that is called from many potential places thank you hello everyone welcome to my lecture programmers have a number of third party tools to create network servers and clients in python but the core module for all of those tools is socket this module exposes all of the necessary pieces to quickly write tcp and udp clients and servers use raw sockets and so forth for the purpose of breaking in or maintaining access to target machines this module is all you really need let's start by creating some simple clients and servers the two most common quick network scripts you will write tcp client there have been countless times during penetration tests that i have needed to whip up a tcp client to test for services send garbage data foos or any number of other tasks if you are working within the confines of large enterprise environments 
you won't have the luxury of networking tools or compilers and sometimes you will even be missing the absolute basics like the ability to copy slash paste or an internet connection this is where being able to quickly create a tcp client comes in extremely handy but enough jabbering let's get coding here is a simple tcp client import socket target host equal to www.google.com target port equal to 80 hashtag create a socket object number one client is equal to socket dot socket bracket socket dot af uh, inet comma socket dot shock stream hashtag connect the client number two client connect bracket target host target port hashtag send some data number three client send bracket inverted comma get slash http slash 1.1 slash r slash n host google dot com slash r slash n slash r slash n inverted comma bracket close receive some data number four response equal to client dot receive bracket 4096 print response e we first create a socket object with the af in init and socket stream parameters one the af init parameter is saying we are going to use a standard ip v4 address or host name and shock stream indicates that this will be a tcp client when then connect the client to the server and send it some data the last step is to receive some data back and print out the response this is the simplest form of tcp client but the one you will write most often in the above code snippet we are making some serious assumptions about sockets that you definitely want to be aware of the first assumption is that our connection will always succeed and the second is that the server is always expecting us to send data fast as opposed to servers that expect to send data to you fast and await your response our third assumption is that the server will always send us data back in a timely fashion. We make these assumptions largely for simplicity's sake. While programs have varied options about how to deal with blocking sockets, exception handling in sockets, and the like, it's quite rare for pin testers to build these nice ties into the quick and dirty tools for recon or ex exploitation work so we will omit them later UDP client a Python UDP client is not much different than a TCP client we need to make only two small changes to get it to send packets in UDP form import socket target host equal to inverted comma 127.0.0.1 target port equal to 80 hashtag create a socket object number one client equal to socket dot socket bracket socket dot af init comma socket dot sock dgram hashtag send some data client dot send to bracket inverted comma triple a triple b triple c comma bracket target host comma target port bracket close hashtag receive some data data comma addr equal to client dot receive from bracket 4096 print data as you can see we change the socket type to shock dgram at number one when creating the socket object the next step is to simply call send to bracket number two passing in the data and the server you want to send the data to because UDP is a connectionless protocol there is no call to connect bracket beforehand the last step is to call receive from bracket at number three to receive UDP data pack you will also notice that it returns both the data and the details of the remote host and port.
again we are not looking to be superior network programs we want to be quick easy and reliable enough to handle our day-to-day -day hacking tasks let's move on to creating some simple servers replacing netcat netcat is the utility knife of networking so it's no surprise that storage system administrators remove it from their systems one more than one occasion i have run into servers that do not have netcat installed but do have python in these cases it's useful to create a simple network client and server that you can use to push files or to have a listener that gives you command line access if you have broken in through a web application it is definitely worth dropping a python callback to give you secondary access without having to first burn one of your trojan or backdoors creating a tool like this is also a great python exercise so let's get started import sys import socket import get top import threading import sub process hashtag define some global variables listen equal to false command is equal to false upload equal to false execute equal to inverted comma target equal to inverted comma upload destination equal to inverted comma port equal to zero here we are just importing all of our necessary libraries and setting up global variables no heavy lifting quite yet now we begin by reading in all of the command line options and setting the necessary variables depending on the option we detect if any of the command line parameters don't match our criteria we print out useful edges information in the next block of code we are trying to mimic netcat to read data from dean and send it across the network as noted if you plan on sending data interactively you need to send a ctrld to bypass the state dean read the final piece is where we detect that we are set up a listening socket and process further commands upload a file execute a command start a command cell thank you